to the Foul Play YouTube channel. Open Mic Edition. Channel. Open Mic Edition. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to Open Mic number 104. And today we're going back to Deb Strauss Part 2 Deposition. And we should be able to finish that up pretty quick. I don't think there's a big Jeff looked ahead and there's not that many pages. Uh, probably a lot of lawyer stuff, and I think he said there's some references and so forth. So uh, once we finish that one, we're going to move on to the next one. There's another deposition on May 13th, 2006, and that's uh, Jennifer Nashall. And, of course, as we know, she was part of the mechanism where reports got turned in between Deb Strauss and, and uh, Amy Lehman. They went to Jennifer, and she began the process of putting those reports together for to be passed on to others as we'll learn as we go along into these depositions. Anyway, so let's, uh, we started almost on time today. We were close. <laughs> let's quickly say hello to everyone in uh, Discord, and then we'll capture the live chat right quick, and then we can get to it. So, Alice, how are you? I'm good, thanks, Jack. It's lovely to see we have a nice full panel tonight. And hello to everyone in chat. Excellent. And Big Jeff, back again for more punishment with Deb Strauss. Well, I mean, you, you have to know the 1985 case to understand the 2005 case. And it's just great that uh, we have so many people here to, 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 to go through it, put eyes on it, put minds on it. This is exactly what needs to happen, uh, you know, to, to, to be able to put the guilters in their place, right? <clears throat> right. Uh, no, you know how many people you need to pull off such a large conspiracy? We're looking at it right now. <laughs> at most it's seriously probably less than what we've gotten in this chat right here to make it work and you're right and it's got to go back it has to, it all goes back to 1985 absolutely and disco from across the pond another one Woo thanks for coming oh i'm very happy to be here must admit i'm a bit fan girling because uh nice to be on the panel with jeff for the first time such a great researcher and i agree going back to 85 just like Laura's, uh, I think it's Mora demo says, um, they just keep repeating that, and I think it's important, and that's what we're doing, so crack on. Absolutely, and he is a great researcher, have to agree. And Cherie, how are you? I'm good. Uh, looking forward to this discussion, and hello, everybody. Uh, and it did it again, Doc. I said Cherie, and my phone went... Uh, my iPhone went, what? Blah, 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 Siri. I'm not kidding. You know, you know what, Jack61? Just deny everything. <laughs> I'm going to have to. <laughs> uh, and uh, we have Jinxie. Hello. Hey, everyone. Hope you're all doing well. And just as uh, my thoughts on this civil suit, had it, he not been uh, convicted of murder, he would have won, <laughs> unlike Colburn, who's going to lose. <laughs> Yeah, or at minimum, I, I think, <laughs> or at minimum, I think he would have um, reached a, a good settlement out of court. I don't think a man to walk out of ever wanted this in court. I'm sure of it, actually. So, and then, uh, Lady Neverly, how are you? Oh, Jack, I'm doing pretty good. Thank you. Hello, everybody on the panel and in, in the chat. You know what? We should watch out and quit meeting like this people are going to start to talk <laughs> no doubt and hopefully so christina how are you today looking forward to roasting deb strauss i think like we all are um, she for me deb strauss had the opportunity to make this case right from the beginning and instead she chose to help steer it um to the garbage mess that it is today um and her deposition is just fun to um take apart so i look forward to it and hi to everyone on the panel um you're all amazing at what you do and i'm just grateful to be a part of it yep uh, i agree with you christina she had the opportunity to reveal the truth, and she chose instead to bury it. That's my opinion. And of course, Dr. Sutman, how are you, sir? Um, thank you very much, uh, Jack61. I'd like to welcome all my panel, 
panel members and everyone in chat. It's great to be here. And yes, I really look forward to these discussions. Uh, they really do reveal a lot about what happened in the past. Uh, they are very important. And it's great to see Big Jeff on the panel. Welcome. Yeah, absolutely, Doc. I, I totally agree. Thank you, Doc. Good to be here. Excellent. So well, with that said, um, you know, t just briefly tying in what we've been discussing with um, uh, in Farak's book, which, which yesterday was a, a really, really, really good discussion, I thought, because there, it wasn't just one thing. It was a cadre, a, a cadre of elements that tied in all of it. Um, I, I thought it just I, it was really good to me. Um, I really enjoyed that. Great chapter, Alibi. What a great chapter. It, it was an aw awesome chapter, but I think it's also a credit um, to our team as well um, that we are able to bring a lot of uh, different points all together and see where everything ties in. And I think that's really, really important, Jack61, like we're doing now with the depositions, because we're not just talking about factoids. We're not just talking about a fact here or a fact there. We're presenting a, a potential real narrative, alternative narrative to what happened to Teresa. And uh, yeah, it's a credit to the team. That was an awesome discussion yesterday. It was. And, and, and this undercurrent of other things, they're not necessarily openly said, but it's that that undercurrent uh, of theme, uh, the implication of what they were actually doing, that didn't ever, ever make it to a report, no doubt, because we go back to that interview with, with uh, Bobby Dassey in the November 9th interview that Gene Scott, and everything that did not make it in that report that, that, that was discussed in it, 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 it's insane. So, hence, when these reports get written, we can clearly see Everything is based upon what that officer or whatever chooses to include in that report. So there is this other undercurrent. So anyway, yeah, it was a great discussion. So, uh, yeah, let's get it on. I want to greet everyone in the live chat right quick. We've got, um, let's see, the lovely dark side and cool that. And uh, there's Ronald Cass, TTM fangirl, my neighbor. Uh, I would say she's a next door neighbor. It's not quite next door, but. Not too far. And great to see you. And there's Matt. Uh, who else we have here? There's Cher. Becca. Hey, Becca. Thanks for coming. Uh, there's, um, da, 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 da. there's Gloria. Um, We've got uh, JD. There's Andy B. I can't, we can't go without mentioning Andy or you know what's going to happen, right? He's going to punch me. There's Kay. Thanks for, com <laughs> thanks for coming, Kay. We've got Case 10, Mick Manning, JD, Pete Moss, TTM Fangirl, Veronica Moss. Veronica? Veronica? I don't want to say her name wrong. I, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Thanks for coming. Who else we got before we yeah. move on? I think you got it. Veronique. It's French. Oui, oui. Ah, well, see, I, I'm, I'm leery to say that because my it'll probably trigger Siri again on my iPhone. Because if I say Sherry's name, that's it. I said it. I said it quietly that time, and it didn't. All right. We've got Jen Corona, um, Nan's life, Colette. There's Ask Coffee just joined us. Iced coffee. Um, lime, 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 not lime, limelight girl, lime lit girl. Hey, hello. Yep, and I got your uh, name there. Okay, excellent. All right, let's. Um, like I said, we're at page one fourteen in the Deb Strauss deposition, and it's. It's uh, like 150 some pages, but apparently it ends pretty quickly here. Let me get it pulled up here so we can we can get rolling. Uh, 
Big Jeff, you you want to? Let me pull this up here, and we'll we'll get some things assigned here, so it's easy to find. Sure, it was me and Jeff that were doing it last time, Jack. Yeah, it was. I did. Uh, well, I did uh, walk Kelly, but um, <clears throat> since this is the cross examination, the vast number of questions are being asked for, by Cavelli. Is very well, interestingly Vogel's lawyer, and it's it's when you look at these depositions, it's interesting that Vogel's lawyer kind of takes the lead on this stuff. Yes. Um, you know that's uh, why why him? Like why not the F, you know the FBI lawyer or the lawyer from Manitowoc? Why Vogel's lawyer? I, I, yeah, I, I, I totally agree. So um, if you want, you can play Mr. Cobelli. Looks like he's doing the lead in questioning Alice. If you want to play Deb. And then uh, I can do if if Glenn or Kelly uh, objects, I'll do them. And um, I don't know who else we got here. That let me look. Jinx, are you able to? Jinx and Sheree, are you guys able to follow along and maybe help out with a couple of the other lawyers? It, it doesn't matter to me, or even Sunshine, if you want. It, I'm just I'm just trying to keep voices separate so we can have you because we got a room full of freaking lawyers here jack i don't know if it helps you but i could totally do it in 20 minutes or so well maybe when we get to jennifer nationals yeah. then yeah. it'll be excellent. yeah just assign me someone and as long as i'm as long as my phone's cooperating i don't mind reading at all and if her phone <laughs> dies i'll i'll do her part <laughs> okay i'm here too, so Okay. I can, I can help if needed. So, Sheree, if you want to do Pollen and Finkelmeyer, and uh, I can't remember the other two names, uh, Sunshine, there's there's two more lawyers in the room besides. So, if you want to pick them up, I don't know if that they'll, because we don't have far to go, so I don't have much objection that we'll have those, but I think that should cover everyone. All righty. So, let's, uh, let's begin, and, and let's keep in mind again. This is Deb Strauss, May 13th, 2006, six months approximately before the all the hell and shit hits the fan and, uh, for Avery and, and Teresa Halbach and, and that whole quagmire. This investigation was commenced by Peg Lautenschlager, Glenn Kelly, and Walt. Um, I say, Walt, uh, Glenn and, and, and Kelly are in these depositions. They're armed with statements from these various people that they had given throughout this investigation. So their goal, again, is to find out everything they could about what these people knew about Gregory Allen and when they knew it. That was their goal. We're at the Deb Strauss, Deb Strauss Part 2 at the end. She had testified the day before as well. And so we're basically at the end of her deposition. So. Big Jeff, you can start whenever you wish. Yeah, if I could just pile onto that uh, set of goals for a second. <clears throat> if, if you look at the peg whitewash, it's important to keep the goals in mind. Was there any um, misconduct or you know um, not following of the rules that happened during the investigation itself, right? Which included um, you know knowledge, uh, you know de deliberately ignoring knowledge of Gregory Allen. But remember, there was a whole bunch of things that happened to Avery, right? They, you know, the, um, the the lineup, for example, was not done by the rules, obviously, especially if that thing was traced, the, the mugshot, <laughs> the, the lack of a phone call for seven days. There were a lot of things that were done wrong uh, in that in that trial. We were supposed to uncover that. If you read Deb, uh, Peg's whitewash, none of it happened. So. Well, and, and that stack of photographs that Chris Eric was delivered and he pocketed, remember? He got that stack of yes, photographs, that, and he, he had requested specifically Avery's photograph. There was so much horseshit that happened during that 85 case that Kosorek took control of. We, we know that, and it, it's even now pretty well suspected that Vogel may have been at the hospital as well. So, don't know that for sure. I don't think we got to, uh, we could say that for sure, but that line of question. I asking about it. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely did. Yeah. <laughs> Can we just also add into what was going on behind the scenes that Gregory Allen's DNA had been collected for another rape 
by um, a Minnesota and Dodge County detective. Um, this this deposition was on the 13th. I think his DNA was collected the week was, prior. No, it was no. The judge signed it that week, the week prior, and they collected it in June. Remember? They collected said, in June. Yes. Yeah, well, no, I, I don't. I just know it was May that um, because I have the report. Yes. The report matching it was on done on the 29th. So I I thought um so I well, know that they knew oh, by June 29th Gregory Allen was the guy. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I may yeah. be remembering it incorrectly, Christina, but I, is I, I thought that the judge signed it right around the first week of May, which was right before mm -hmm. this. They went mm -hmm. in June and collected his first of June and collected it the, his DNA, right. and it was matched by the end of June. The arrest warrant was written in September of 06, while the depositions were still yeah. going on in full swing. Yeah, yeah. And I, they and, and, and they and they hid it from everyone. I think I think that that DNA match was the catalyst to change the focus, the media. How do I put this? To change the narrative in the media. They had to stop. They had, they had to scare the hell out of them. Avery. Well, no, they had to. What they had to do was stop everyone from looking at Gregory Allen. Because if a good reporter would have got a hold of this information and busted it open, they never would have been able to sell Stephen Avery as a serial assaulter, right? Um, because everyone would have been, how did you let this guy stay free to assault and how many other victims? That's the key. We still have no clue how many other cases they buried just because they don't want this information on the national stage, you know? Absolutely. Um, I'll see some chat in the uh, loud chat about Cuss Road, and um, yeah, I mean, we're not really focused too much on that today. I mean, if you guys want to talk about it, that's that's entirely uh, up to you. But I mean, our focus is death drives. But you know, the thing about Cuss Road, we had a really good discussion yesterday about it. And no matter how one slices it up, unless this was just a gigantic red herring, which I don't believe, there's there's too many other things that that are in place in, uh, in front of it or, or, or actually after Coast Road that tells me there was an event there. They found something. That's me. That's my, just my opinion. No one, no one else has to believe me. But, you know, as, well, especially, you know, uh, the disturbed earth, uh, unfiled warrant, <clears throat> Fallon's own reply in his motion to beating a string in the court. I'm sorry that there's something else there, but anyway, I don't want to, I don't want to digress. Let's, uh, with all the points in mind that big Jeff and, and, uh, Christina pointed, let's keep that in mind. And, uh, big Jeff, whenever you can, whenever you and Alice are ready, let's do it. Okay. Beginning on line seven, man. Good afternoon. Hello. My name is Claude Cavelli and I represent Mr. Vogel in Manitowoc County. And I have a few follow-up questions. <clears throat> okay. Mr. Kelly, during his examination, asked you a number of questions about whether certain events occurred in 1985 or not. Do you remember that? Yes. He asked you whether certain things were said in 1985 or not. True? Correct. Now, just to make it clear, you have no personal knowledge of whether these events occurred or didn't occur in 1985, correct? Correct. I mean, you weren't there. No. <clears throat> you have no personal knowledge whether those things were said, correct? Correct. Your involvement came some 18 years later when you talked to people about what they may or may not have seen, sorry, what, what may or may not have occurred back then. <clears throat> yeah. With respect to the district attorney's file that was provided, did you do any research or analysis to uh, on chain of evidence to determine whether that file was com the complete file that existed back in 1985. No. Do you know anything about whose hands that file may have been in between 1985 and the time that your office acquired that file? 
No, I do not. Due to any investigation with respect to chain of evidence as far as what was called the defense or the public defender file? No. Do you know whether the file well, did, was that file ever physically obtained to your knowledge by the department? I do not believe it was. Do you know whether whatever was, sh was shown was something shown to the department that purported to be at, at least part of the defense or the public defender's file in the Avery case? I don't know. I was, it was never given to me. Okay. So you have no information that you're aware of that established the chain of evidence that whatever was shown to the department recently in the past year or so was in fact the complete file of the public defender's office defending Mr. Avery back in 1985. Correct. Your role, as I understand it, from listening to your testimony, was not to prepare Exhibit 7, the report. Correct. Your role was to investigate, correct? Correct. Don't hear Alice. <laughs> and in investigating, you were gathering whatever information you found that could be available, true? True, yes. You took all information without regard to whether you may or may not have thought such information would be admissible in a court of law. Correct. That wasn't your role, right? Correct. So if somebody told you what somebody told what somebody told somebody uh, and who is no longer alive and you took that down, whether or not that was something that might be admissible in evidence or not, true? Correct. And, and based upon all of that information that you collected, that helped you decide what other things you should look, you look to and other people you should talk to. Yeah. Did any, uh, were you able, as far as you know, to perform the investigation that you wanted to perform? Yes. Okay. Is there anybody that told you that no, they didn't want you to investigate something, or they didn't want you to talk to any particular person? No. Was there any time where you asked to perform an investigation that you were, was, excuse me, was there, was there any time where you asked to perform an investigation that you were instructed not to with respect to this matter? No. <clears throat> Are you satisfied that the investigation had been completed to the best of your ability at the time Exhibit 7 was prepared? Yes. Now you were asked many questions by Mr. Kelly, uh, and referring to the various uh, re and referring to the various re reports you prepared, is that correct? Yes. Did he pick and choose sentences out of those reports? Yes. Okay. Did he read, well, strike that, the reports that, uh, were, were you able to answer his questions without specifically looking at your reports for, for the most part, as far as the details of the investigation you performed? No. Okay. Why was it that you didn't have a recall of all those details? Well, we had done this investigation in late 2003, and since that time, We've talked to a lot of people on a lot of other different cases. More than a year had elapsed, right? Yes. When you were talking to witnesses about the Avery trial, the Avery investigation and the Avery prosecution. You were talking about events that had occurred 18 years earlier. Is that true? Yes. Many of the witnesses that you talked to didn't have any documents like your reports to refresh their recollections, is that right? That's correct. Those witnesses that you talked to, uh, were there any of them that were unaware, uh, unaware of the DNA testing and the announcement that Mr. Avery had been cleared? No. Were there any that were unaware that Mr. Allen had been implicated by the DNA evidence? 
No. <clears throat> Some folks have told you 18 years later that they thought that Alan, it was Alan all along, right? Correct. Had they come forward with that information before the announcement of the DNA information? Not since they made it their original cl complaint 18 years ago prior. They did? Right. Well, objection, asked and answered. Well, you, you don't know. Uh, there is some controversy as to whether the statements were made or what was said at... Objection. Back in 1985, true? Objection. What statements? Well, this that's a good point. Uh, the, the statements that people knew or suspected or had a gut feeling that the person that committed the crime in question was Mr. Allen and not Mr. Avery. Correct. What role did Ms. Badker play in the Avery investigation? Let me see if I can. Um, that's 5511. So I think you. So I'm sorry. You're getting to know the exhibits pretty well. Uh, Council, may I ask when you say what role did she play in the investigation? Do you mean the 2003? No. Attorney General's review? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll clarify. Or do you mean the investigation back in 1985? I'll clarify. Thank you. Uh, did you, did, did looking at Bates 5511, which is in exhibit, uh, what, uh, what folder are you looking at there? 15. My understanding is that Ms. Badker had been a paralegal in the district attorney's office for about nine years at that time. Correct. So since roughly 1994, is that right? Yes. And prior to that, she had been a secretary? Yes. So in 1985, she was a secretary, is that right? Yes, I believe she was. Did Ms. Badker have any contact or participate in any way, to your knowledge, in the investigation of the Avery case? No. Did she have uh, play any role in the prosecution of the Avery case? No. Did she read any reports in the Avery case? That I don't know. I don't know what she sees. Did she hear any testimony in the Avery case? I don't know if she sat through the testimony or not. Now, she said that uh, she said it was possible that she had seen Alan on one occasion at the counter in the district attorney's office. Do you remember that? I think it's on 5584. 5584? Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I misspoke. I was looking at the wrong. Uh, let's see if I can find it for you real quick. I believe she said that she knew of Alan because he was he had previously been charged of other crimes by the district attorney's office. He and he may have come to the front counter for, for some reason. So that's how she would have known him. Okay. Did you inquire how it was that she recalled some 18 years later that Mr. Allen had come to the counter in the district attorney's office? No. She referred to her belief about the case as a gut instinct? Correct. Your knowledge, had she heard anything with respect to the basis upon which the victim based her positive identification of Mr. Avery in the case? I'm going to object just to the extent of, I may have misheard you. Could I have the question again, please? Did Miss Badker okay. ever indicate that she had heard any of the victim's testimony with respect to the basis for PB's positive identification of Mr. Avery? I do not believe she did. You can look at Bates 5107, which might be in the other... Mine starts at 54. 
Are you talking about 17, uh, Mr. Cavalli, Exhibit 17? Uh, maybe. 5107? 5107? Whoa. It's Alan, uh, Arlen Avery statement. I, I think that's up in the 5400s. Let, let me let me just look. I might have gotten my bait stamps confused here. As five 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 nine. I wasn't even close. Oh, I I have the duplicate. Oh. The the other the other format. I'm sorry. Right. Uh, th did Arlen Avery tell you that he told Defense Attorney Evans? about seeing the cement on Mr. Avery's shoulder at the time of his arrest. Is there some paragraph you're referring to? It's on page two. It would be the third full paragraph. He had... He, I think she, the answer there is he had, indicating a positive answer. Is that what that means? I just want to make sure we get this right. Uh, I'm not sure that because Sorry. she she continues to answer. So okay, um, and, and what and what does it say? It says for Arlen, Arlen Avery told Vogel that Stephen Avery had the white concrete powder on his shoulder the night he was arrested. Arlen Avery stated that Vogel ignored him. Arlen Avery stated that he also relayed this information to Risa Evans. Do you know if at the trial, the defense asked Arlen Avery whether he observed cement on the on Avery, on Mr. Avery the night of his arrest? Oh. Bear with me, I'm kind of skipping around. That's okay. And just trying to, uh, I'd like to refer you to Mr. Belts. Again, I've got 5305, but I bet I've got the wrong number. Uh, what are we looking for? It's your belt statement. Uh, from Mr. Baskin, 5562. 5562, thank you. Okay. On the second page, one, two, three, fourth last paragraph, does it read... Uh, did you, did Mr. Belt tell you this? Belt stated he was a little doubtful about Avery being the correct suspect. Bernson was an excellent witness and the jury did a good job. Belt said um, that the only thing that, that made Belt feel like Avery probably did it was that Bernson was such a good witness. Did I read that correctly? Yes. Is that what he told you? Yes. Did he also tell you that he did not know who Gregory Allen was until after Avery was relieved from prison? Yes. Yeah. I'd like to refer you to Mr. Bulgert's statement. Okay, it's the 5564. You interviewed Mr. Bulgert. Did you have his file available? No, I don't believe he did. Okay. And so you're talking to him again about events that occurred 18 years earlier. Is that right? Yes. If you look at one, two, third, the last paragraph, what he said at the time was he couldn't remember doing any research on other subjects. Is that correct? Where are we now? Uh, the third to the last paragraph. On page. No, the second page. Second page. 65. Last paragraph of the statement. Oh, okay. Yes. When was, when, when he was asked what he would have done had he known about other possible suspects, suspects, he said he didn't know. Yes. He was shown his letter where he asked about Brian Garrison. When was he shown his letter where he asked about Brian Garrison, another suspect? Yes. 
Uh, Mr. Bolgart responded that that was his signature on the letter. He had no memory of that at the at the at that point in time. Correct. Correct. And I believe uh, I'd like to refer you. Uh, I guess it's Exhibit 15 at 5506. I think that's the statement from Risa Evans. Hopefully that's right. 505. Good, good. As the first. One, uh, my first one, one, my one in a row, congratulating himself for finally getting a number right. <laughs> was, Risa Evans, <laughs> was Risa Evans at the hospital? No. Did Risa Evans indicate that she had any personal knowledge as to the sequence of events that occurred with respect to the composite drawing and the showing of any photograph of Mr. Avery? No. Now, one of the things that you were investigating was the assertion that the composite drawing may have been drawn by, uh, by using Mr. Avery's photograph. Is that correct? Uh, that was one of the things you were, that was, that some people said might have happened. Correct. Okay. So you went and you interviewed the people that had firsthand personal knowledge about that, correct? Yes. <clears throat> okay. At the same time that uh, that assertion was made that the composite drawing was made from a picture of Mr. Avery, the same, another assertion was being made that the composite drawing didn't look like Mr. Avery at all, right? Well, I object. Another assertion was made where? What are you talking about? Well, well, in this case, they've asserted that members of the district attorney's office looked at the composite, and they thought it didn't look like Mr. Avery. It looked like somebody else, Mr. Allen. Recall somebody, I don't know who, thinking the composite didn't look like him because the composite had curly hair. And I believe Mr. Avery had straight hair or vice versa. All right. So you're getting information both that somebody thinks maybe the composite was drawn from a photograph of Mr. Avery and other assertions that the composite doesn't look like Mr. Avery at all. Sure, yes. Okay, th those are kind of competing, right? Yes. So what you did in your investigation is you went and talked to the people who had firsthand information about the making of the composite, right? Yes. Okay. Those people with firsthand information, none of them indicated that a photograph of Mr. Avery was used? Objection. I think you have to identify who we're talking about, quote, unquote, those people is what I mean. By the persons that you interviewed that had firsthand knowledge that participated in the preparation of the composite, who were they? Jean Couchet drew the picture. Okay. And who was involved in providing him information upon which he drew the picture? The victim, Mrs. Bernstein. You did, you did interview them to determine if a picture of Mr. Avery was used to draft the composite? Yes, we did. Okay. And, did, uh, and what were your findings? What did they tell you? Again, either a more accurate description would be in the reports, but I believe they said they don't recall using a photo to draw the picture. Did Mr. Couchet deny that he even knew what Mr. Avery looked like when he made the composite? Yes. I'm just looking through to see if there's any more... That's fine. ...questions that I need to touch base with you on. That's all I have. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, I can't remember who did Mr. Kelly. I, I can do Mr. Kelly to finish this out because we don't have. Before we start, though, for this uh, recross, any thoughts? Because I know I have a few. I were. <laughs> Where do you start? He didn't you know he's asked me his fucking elbow, his exhibit numbers, his fucking statements. Jesus. <laughs> and he calls himself a lawyer. 
he was he, he was kind of all over the place. They, they did renumber the exhibits at the beginning of this. Uh, th- sorry, I think it was during the Tinker the Tinker deposition. They, they buy some different numbering system, but he should have been familiar with it by now. And by that point, yeah, I, I have to agree. I mean, to me, I agree with Alice. He seemed confused and and not. <sighs> I, I don't know. He just he was just all over the place to me, trying to uh, throw a little shade on this, mainly the the picture and the, uh, the this composite drawing. Which, again, I think he traced it. I know Doc certainly. Well, <laughs> I don't know, Doc. Do you think he traced it, Touche? <laughs> oh, so there's no doubt. But you know, it's the old classic. Do you think honestly, those involved in some type of conspiracy are openly going to admit? to a, such a conspiracy, of course they're going to deny it. So this is the obvious frustration that you can see throughout these um, depositions. Everyone, the first thing that everyone says is either I don't recall or no, I deny, deny, deny. So the question is, is that what is really disconcerting here is that the attorney is obviously trying to find a way out. You know, is there a, is there a, a logical explanation of how Couchet could have drawn this diagram that looked remarkably like a Stephen Avery's jail photo, right? So they're trying to come up with all these alternatives rather than looking at what is so obvious. And that's why it's so frustrating listening to these depositions. It's just a game. It really is just a game. It is. It's a word game. Absolutely agree, Doc. And, and to me, there, there's absolutely, you know, Another really good point about um, the couche drawing or tracing, whatever, is that as far as I know, he he never did any afterwards either. And he was so proud of that one, had to get that jail photo out of there along with his tracing and hang, hung it up in his home, you know. Well, I do think... We, do, we well, have, do we have it handy to I show it to people? Do we, let me see if I can find it. Uh, yeah, I don't. I didn't pull that one, but yeah, that's probably not a bad idea if you can find it quickly. I can. I can put it up on screen that way everybody's well aware. Exactly, exactly what we're talking about. So I'm wondering, is anyone else feeling like they had two lines of defense? One, they were going to diminish the women in this case. Um, you know, Penny Burnson's ideas, what what made everyone believe Stephen was guilty. Uh, Badker was a lowly secretary who had no idea how police work. She had only gotten a brief glimpse of Alan. So what's her word matter? And the what was the public defender's name that started with the B? He didn't even remember signing the letter that... Um, you know what I mean? So they were just going to kind of make it all look that they were, that was going to be their game plan. Um, but we all know that there was so much more evidence than they were ever going to be able to minimize, um, that they intentionally framed him. You talking about, you you talking about, you talking about Bogart? Bogart. Yep. That's his name. B guy. Yep. So I just find it interesting that, um, you know, the more we we research these cases, the more we recognize um, bad, bad strategy, right? But when you have no strategy because your guys are guilty, all you ca- all you can do is try and try and go with bad strategy, right? So you blame it on the other dude. Uh, you minimize the evidence to try and make it look like it's not that as bad. And then you, uh, you know, make the DOJ lady look like she really didn't do as great of a job as she did. Um, I just find it all interesting because if you flip it and, and look at them as the criminals, because that's what they are in this case, you can see what they're doing. Yeah. I uh, I agree with Miss uh, I agree with Sunshine Christina. I think what they're trying to do here, if you look at the upshot, they're trying to mi- minimize the um, the damage, right? They, they they know that they did wrong. Then they're caught. Um, and the yeah, and the consequences 
the fallout of this is potentially huge, not only for the $36 million, but also for the careers and reputations of a lot of people. So what they're trying to do is to come up with the most bullshit, inundane excuses as to how this error could have possibly taken place. I agree with Sunshine. I think what they're trying to do is to minimize or dilute the impact of what happened. Yep, I totally agree. And of course, Covelli, you know, he's trying his best to uh, defend Bogle uh, because uh, that guy, man, he, he's up to his eyeballs in this and he knows it. Uh, you know, unfortunately, or, or and or unfortunately, you know, as we know, this huge event that happens six months later um, completely demolishes all this. Again, without this, all this other knowledge that Christina mentioned earlier about Gregory Allen that was going on behind the scenes that they kept hidden. They kept they kept their hands around that so tight. If that shit would have come out, I'm telling you, it would have absolutely blown these depositions up. It, it definitely would have. And I just want to make the comment, I think the only person that really um, <laughs> sweated under the spotlight was Mark Rohrer, right? Uh, you could tell he knew, he knew what was coming. Right, the uh, the train was coming down the track straight towards him, and he was sweating profusely. He was very very nervous, and it's really unbelievable. We can see the injustice that's being done here, right? And the state never apologized, never gave a formal apology, and now they're trying to deflect and divert their responsibilities. And how crazy is it for Jean Couchet? who's meant to be a police sketch artist, to actually frame his sketch and put it in his office or house and has never done a sketch since. To me, guys, this is the height of being perverse, right? What, what type of pleasure did Couchet obtain by ha framing the picture and putting it in his room? That's clearly crazy. That's his job. As a sketch artist, that's your job. Get on with the next one. Maybe he was trying to take it out of evidence. Maybe he maybe he was like trying to get it out of there um, because it was earlier asked in the same deposition whether or not you know copies of that uh, sketch were made and distributed around. And the answer to that was no. Um, yeah. Maybe he was very interested in getting that out of circulation very quickly. What safer place than up on his wall, making it look like True. some crazy trophy? It's a trophy. It is absolutely <laughs> a trophy because he, he would have been gloating to think, wow, I hope now Steve Avery, another scumbag in prison, right? Until it all blew up in their faces and it was extremely embarrassing for them. Absolutely. But Jeff you is know, linked. Just, I'm sorry. I just what? want to share this. I just had a thought. What if Couché had that hanging on his office wall? As a reminder to Kasurik, you know what I did for you, right? So uh, every maybe. time, yeah, <laughs> that's an interesting thought. And I don't know, but it, in the record, you can see when he takes it out of evidence to like hang it in his office. There's like a note of it. I didn't get to, you know, I didn't get to see everything I wanted to when I was at rally looking at the 85 record. I was just trying to find juror names at that point. I wish I could go back. <laughs> I think it works on many levels, actually, as an intimidation, uh, you know, of what, you, what, what your power is and what you can do within the police and the public. You know, it could work on many levels. It's just such a more narcissistic move. Yeah, and, and all these political, I mean, there, there's definitely political games being played within their own department. We all know that because we've seen it uh, in numerous uh, situations, not only at Manitowoc, but Calumet as well. I'm sure that's this kind of thing goes on at the DCI and, and all these other branches. So it's a good point. Anyway, uh, Big Jeff has linked uh, me a, uh, it's a clip from Jeff Jones uh, dis discussing a murder. Hopefully, uh, and I will link this uh, clip um, in the video description, giving, you know, full credit to, to Jeff and his channel. Uh, we're going to play this little clip. It shows, uh, I think, a transition. Is that right? With uh this photograph and the tracing, is that what you got? That's correct, yes. All right, so uh, if you're on, uh, if you're in Discord, you're going to have to unmute YouTube. 
uh, you got to unmute YouTube for just a moment. We'll play this. It's not very long. So let's play this uh, little clip here and we can rebut it. He made uh, was actually a sketch that he independently envisioned out of his own mind, or whether or not he traced the, the, the picture of Stephen, you know, perhaps using a light box or perhaps overlaying a piece of paper on a, 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 co a computer screen. And what you're looking at now is a sort of an overlay graphic that he did where he took the uh, the quote unquote um, Jean Coucher sketch and he's overlaying that as a transparency onto the uh, the mugshot of Stephen Coucher from the from the Judy Dvorak uh, uh, sorry from from the uh, Sandra Morris arrest that happened earlier in that year so I mean if you if you just look at how the eyes just are sort of overlapping and the, and, and look look at the lines on the right hand side of the mouth right how, how, the, how the lips are exactly overlapping and as uh, dr. Silkman pointed out earlier how the hairline is uh, you know at the top and, and around the beard how that's perfectly framing the exact aspect pretty clear to me I don't know about you guys Oh yeah, he traced it. You know what's em what's embarrassing is that oh, absolutely you can get a you can get a couple of high school kids right in probably maybe even in primary school and ask them the question, what do you think is the origin of this picture? And everyone will say it's been traced, right? And the the uh, light bulb moment for me was the fact that uh, Jean Couchet was able to draw the hair outline with a gap on the left hand side. Right, guys, in perfect synchronicity. That's right. Stephen Avery's old photo. Now, you know, you try and draw a face, somebody's face, it's almost impossible to get the correct proportions of the eyes, the nose, the mouth, absolutely correct. Now, if you have a look, as um, Big Jeff pointed out and alluded to, it's a complete match, 100% match. Now, Jean Couchet was not a master artist or a Picasso. He had done a couple of lessons in drawing. Yet, from memory, he was able to absolutely get all the anatomical details 100% correct. You know, if I was Jean Couchet, I would have thrown away my police badge, gone to the Riviera, and started painting portraits. He would have made a million dollars. Well, <laughs> not only that, not only that, he should have ran all off to... Uh... Las Vegas and just gambled whatever because yeah, he would have come up, come up aces every time. Well, he wanted to go to kiss the Blarney Stone. I think he wanted to do watercolor challenge in Ireland for the rest of the days. <laughs> but uh, it looks like somebody who's cheated at their art homework, as you say. It looks like they've traced it. You know, like if somebody went in with their homework for art, I've seen that happen when we were at school. People just trace stuff, and the teachers knew. So that's what that looks like to me. So, you know, again, I mean, it's really, really great discussion. And it's certainly about that. I'm going to call it a tracing. That's what I believe. Um, but it's important. Again, uh, this Mr. Covelli is trying to defend um, Vogel. There's no doubt about it. He's trying to throw shade on that photograph. Um, and I don't think he did a very good job because he was so scattered. He was all over the damn place to me. So. But, um, but but don't you find it, all jokes aside, don't you find it remarkable? These are meant to be learned gentlemen, right, who have gone to law school. They must absolutely know that shenanigans took place. And what they're trying to do is what Sunshine Christina said, is to deflect and minimise the damage. And even though they know, even though they know that wrong has been done, it's just completely unbelievable. Yeah, um, absolutely. I, I just want to uh, point out that Gregory Allen is six foot tall. Stephen Avery, on a good day, is five two, from what I hear, maybe five four. Um, and I and Penny Bernson had to have her eyes sutured, so they're claiming that she gave a composite detail. 
that uh, Couché was able to conjure up an image that even included the hair part in the wrinkles. But I, I mean, like, it's really it, that bad. And uh, Stephen had longer hair at the time of the arrest, didn't he? Like not that hair. That is the his uh, mugshot from a previous arrest that they traced. So it's not <sighs> conducive to what he looked like at the current time. Is that right? Yeah. It was the same from the last arrest. Correct. Yeah. So. It's so in other words, it's a very recent photograph and we mustn't forget they also lost Gregory Allen's I think it was a nineteen eighty four, is that correct? Uh, Jack sixty one, he's a uh, mugshot from eighty three or eighty four booking, that's correct. It just yeah, correct. Well, disappeared. I think the sword Slain. got it and pocketed it. Uh, correct. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it, good points. It, it's interesting. You if, if we if we look at the um, the questions that Mr. Covelli asks in the Amy Lehman uh, deposition, he does he, he does get into some of those questions <clears throat> with her regarding oh well uh, you know the, the, this the description that Penny Bernstein gave really doesn't look like Mr. Avery at all does it it's you know the wrong height the wrong eye color uh, underwear this and that um, you know so I I really think that uh, you know as Dennis Vogel's attorney. He uh, he was uh, you know feeling a little bit of the you know of the pain uh, during these depositions and saying try, trying to establish a route for saying hey look you know uh, the DA prosecutes the case that the sheriff's office gives them and uh, you know that's uh, wasn't wasn't my doing here. Thank you. That was the other point I was going to make because he is Vogel's attorney. He was trying to minimize Vogel's. Uh, liability and make it all the sheriff's, right? But his issue was the fact that we have, I wonder if they, if they had that letter where um, Gregory Allen had went to Bogle's office and had, um, you know, pleaded with him to intervene with the Manitowoc Police Department. I think that letter is dated in 86, um, and it says clearly he stopped by my office again today, and um, Peterson, what was her name at the time, Brenda Peterson, yeah. says that Gregory Allen was had been to, had, had closed door meetings with Dennis Vogel on several occasions. And I, I just know if we caught that, Glenn and Kelly are on top of their game. They would have they would have minimized any defense that they tried that this was all the sheriff's department and you know Dennis Vogel didn't have culpability. Ice Coffee as as what was Penny Bernstein's reaction to the sketch? You know, I don't remember, but I, I, I personally don't think she could really make it out. Correct. That's um, what I was going to say too, Jack. <laughs> yeah, her, her, eyes, her eyes were very bloodied, and there's no doubt that she would have suffered a lot of bruising. And remember the classic case where she had to sign um, her statement and she couldn't actually see it properly. And, and that goes to show to me that there's an undercurrent here, and that's a rush to judgment. Right. Hey, let's get this wrapped up really super quick. And that's exactly what happened to Stephen in 2005. Right. I rushed the judgment. And so we mustn't forget that Stephen was arrested that very night. OK, so this is truly remarkable police work when you think about it, because Penny was um, sexually assaulted on the beach, uh, taken to the hospital. And that very evening, Stephen Avery was arrested out of his bedroom. All right, that's got to be the fastest police work I have ever seen. Yeah, it and... wasn't a rush to judgment. It was an intentional uh, using a violent crime to arrest a guy they knew didn't commit the crime because they didn't like him. Um, if I remember right, somebody says that. Penny Bertson was on the phone about getting her eyes stitched when they showed her 
the photo or showed her something, the mug shot. So she was on the phone with the surgeon who was wanting to stitch her eyes because they had been split so bad from Gregory Allen's beating her in the face. Um, she, when, yes, Sunshine. Um, I believe that she was showing the sketch and her response was that the nose didn't look right. And that explains why Jean Couchet rubbed out the nose and ch changed it slightly. Because when you look at the overlay that Big Jeff showed us, there's a slight difference in the nose. But you have to admit, the rest of the picture is an absolute tracing of Stephen Avery's early uh, mugshot. The hair, absolutely everything. That's right. And there was no way he could have done that without that photo, in my opinion. And not and only, you know... Just... Go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. I was just going to add in, you know what Doc and, and Christina were talking about, you know, he gets arrested that night out of his bed. This is uh, uh, July, early August, whenever. And if I'm remembering correctly, and I'm, I think I'm right here, the trial began in December that year, four months later. So it, it was pretty quick. Yeah, what I wanted to I, say I is point, that, uh, uh, thanks, Jeff, that uh, Penny Bernstein, not only, you know, the fiasco happened with the uh, tracing of Stephen's picture, but also she said that she was, that Stephen was in the array of pictures of those six or nine pictures. And then when she saw him also in the lineup, she figured it must be him because why else would he be shown up twice? True. Right? Yeah. Yes. They they um sorry, Jack Sixty One. Essentially what they did, Neverly, is they guided a Penny Bernstein to pick out Stephen Avery. Yes. Right? It, was, it was sort of like it's a power of suggestion, kind of. It's the power of suggestion, and Penny said that it was it burnt in my mind. So here you've got Jean Couchet tracing Stephen Avery's picture, showing it to Penny. Then you have uh, the lineup of pictures, and then you have the live lineup. So she's going to pattern match someone who is familiar to her in all three instances. And in no case was the picture of Gregory Allen included in any of those. And I'm telling you right now, had she seen a photo of Gregory Allen, she would have gone, hmm, he looks familiar. But she never got that chance. Right. Yeah. Okay. And Maz is asking, uh, was it Stephen the only man in the lineup with the beard? As I recall, that's correct. I think I can find a picture of the lineup pretty quick. Yeah, as I recall, that that is a correct was statement. It, and Gregory Allen wasn't in the photographs that she was shown either. I don't remember. Right. Maybe, yeah, I don't think he was. Maybe was, Jeff can find that. No, he found that photo. There was, there was no picture of Gregory Allen in the lineup, uh, no. in the, in the uh, photo lineup. But here's the big question, right? Did uh, Kaserik actually have his photograph, his mugshot in his pocket and didn't put it down? That's what I want to find out. Yeah. I mean, they, they, they can play it. I mean, that's why I don't trust photograph identification um, because they can screw that up. I mean, they're supposed to have people that look the same, the same age, the same sort of looks um, and everything like that. And they don't, it can easily be manipulated because the same thing happened to look um, and his photograph because they didn't do a lineup, an actual lineup like what we're seeing on the um, on the screen, um, it was photographs, and Luke was the only one with long hair in the photograph, and not only that, Luke was the only one. Luke had a white background. The rest of them had a darker background. So I do not trust photograph IDs, you know, when they put the six or the nine pictures in front of you, 
because they can fiddle that too much. And that is one of the things that um, was brought up in Luke's case is the fact that the reason why he was picked to it was because the background was different and he was the only one with long hair. And if, I mean, look at Stephen's hair there completely, you know, in the picture that's on the screen. You know what I mean? It's straight, it's long, it kind of, it's kind of nearly covering his eyes. You know what I mean? But yet that's the picture that's been traced. You know, it's, it's ridiculous. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> not even close to me. It's not even close. <clears throat> yeah, it's it's no it's it's no close at all. And no. you show that to Penny when our eyes are probably black and blue, swollen to hell, um, and everything like that. To show her a picture like that, where she probably didn't even recognize it to begin with and just to get over and done with she went aye aye that's it you know well, well she couldn't she, have see it yeah she traumatized she couldn't have see it and they're already throwing his name around and so again this power suggestion that neverly and doc talked about there's no doubt they play that they play that no there's no and as alice said totally alice i agree with you a thousand percent the picture shown and the description of the perpetrators and when they arrest somebody who totally does not resemble what the victim described it's mind-boggling that also happened in daniel's case remember they were describing a short african-american and we have this you know like a rambo looking white asian guy six foot and three muscle how, muscled yes, up and full of muscles yes also, it happened in the Armstrong case that uh, Jer Jerome Buting, in his book, um, I forgot the name of it, but he described that case where, you know, people are describing a short, um, dark-skinned guy, and Mr. Armstrong, who was wrongfully imprisoned, was over six feet tall, long blonde hair, in other words, resembled nothing. Also, in the murder case, when he got shot in the head, he described a guy who was way younger with a super short, like almost shaven head, and they arrested a guy with a bushy, frazzled, dirty looking hair. Yep. If Absolutely. it was the other way around, you know, that somebody got a haircut, you know, so he wouldn't be recognized. I could understand that. But this, no, I cannot. Very uh, we, scary. Disturbing. We know yeah, we all know what when our witness accounts are, are oftentimes so wrong. They're they're just so wrong. Okay, anyway, let's get back to uh, the depot and so we can get this one finished out. So um, I'll do Mr. Kelly. We don't have that many more pages to go. Alice, if you want to continue on? Are you, are you ready? Yep, sure. All righty, we're going to start on line uh, 17. So, um, okay, you testified in response to certain of uh, Mr. Govelli's questions, Ms. Strauss that you believe that the defense file was not turned over to the Justice Department in the course of its 2003 review? I don't believe it was given to me, and I didn't, don't think I saw it. Okay. Uh, I'm going to ask what we mark this with whatever the next exhibit. The reporter says with it a deponent, the opponent's name. Mr. Kelly, please, and the date. That's number 23. Uh, that's what I'm looking for. Uh, just, I'm not sure whether it's 22 or 23. They go off the record and then back on. All right, Mr. Kelly, are we ready, Barbara? Okay, they're back on the record. Yes. Okay. Okay, line 14. Ms. Strauss, I'm going to ask you to take a moment and really take your time and look that up. Okay. Better to read this this way, going to the end of the exhibit. Okay. This is from, if you look at the top left-hand uh, corner, Mr. Tinker's e -file. Yes. Is that correct? And it's... A sequence of emails back and forth involving people within the Department of Justice 
about the receipt of the defense file from the Wisconsin Innocence Project. Okay, yes. It actually, it begins actually, uh, as so often happens with emails, it begins at the end of the exhibit with Steve Tinker on October 14, about 128 in the afternoon saying, quote unquote, any luck on getting the defense file from the project? Oh, on this? Okay. I got two pages here. Right. Yes. But in terms of... Okay. Chronological sequence. Okay, yes. Tinker, who's supervising, is saying to the people who are working with him, including you. Yes. Have we got the defense file from the project yet? Yes. And then the sequence of messages that follows has to do with the responding, uh, has to do with responding to that. Yes. Some people are unhappy about how long it's taken to get the de defense, how long it's taken the defense to get the file, get them the file. But ultimately, what shows up is that the file was delivered by the project on the afternoon of October 14th. Yes. Okay. And that's all I have. And Big Jeff, you've got some more recross here. Uh, oh, line five on page 216. Correct. So, and I think my inquiry uh, initially was whether you had done any investigation on the chain of evidence to determine whether what was received or reviewed by the department, so that was the complete and original public defender's file that existed in 1985, because there might have been a picture like I put in there. <laughs> Does this change your answer in regard to that anyway? No, it does not. Thank you. That's all. Okay. So they ended it, looks like, at 12.57 that day. And you can see there's the big, long index of blah, blah, blah. I got all the words in it and how they're referenced. So, uh, you know, a very interesting uh, two days worth of testimony from Deb Strauss and the really interesting questions by, by Glenn and Kelly. Uh, they're, they're driving to um, find out what they could about, specifically about, you know, Gregory Allen, as, as I've noted before. And, of course, other things that came along with it. Mr. Covelli's questions about this photo. Man, oh, man. Very, uh, I don't know. I think very directed and, and, and then trying to deflect away anything from Vogel or his attempt to. And I think he failed miserably. So, questions, comments before we move on? Because we, we're... Uh, well, we've only been here for an hour, so I think we've got time to at least, if we don't finish, we can at least start on this next deposition, which happened that day. It actually happened right after. Before you do that, could you put the picture that uh, Big Jeff put in in the chat about with the, the lineup? Because our William was asking to see it, and I know he put it in there. Uh, yeah, just one second here. Uh, the hell that One second here. There we go. It's going to pop in. That lets you uh, see what uh, what we're talking about there, uh, our William. You see, Alan. I mean. Uh, Avery is number six here, so. I mean, no one's ever seen one, two, and three, I don't think. Do we, can we ask for that? Do they still have that at the sheriff's department? That would be a sheriff's department record. The picture's taken during the lineup. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Maybe I'll ask for that next. Yeah, that's, okay, here we come. that's probably... 
You're probably gonna have to get that from Barbara Paparin at the clerk of courts. I'm gonna, I'm gonna bet, but I, I could be wrong there. Well, I would think that these pictures were taken at the sheriff's department during the investigation before he was put into the court system. Were they used at trial? Maybe, but that means somebody took them at the sheriff's department. Yeah, I'm just wondering. If, yeah, I agree with you. I, I'm just wondering if they were used as exhibits. Uh, maybe, but, but even yeah. So, you, don't they have a copy at the sheriff's department? Well, they should. Absolutely. I don't know. They it should. was 85. They might not. Who knows? <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, they could have purged it by now, but, you know, I would think of being part of a case, they wouldn't. I don't know. Maybe ask uh, Cummings at the MTSO. Yeah, and is this 40 on the on foul play site, Jack? I don't think so. we we'll probably say this and have uh, maybe get the, yours or, or Zoe to get it into uh, the miscell- miscellaneous photos, whatever, for the 85 case. Yep, that's a good suggestion. But thank Big Jeff for this one. Grazie, sir. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank Google. <laughs> William was asking if it was available. Um, so that's how I was asking, is it on the on the site? But, no, but I mean, I, I'm sure whether it's available or, or not. You know, I mean, you can clearly see it looks completely different to what the sketch is dramatically different to what the sketch is. So how Ben Penny can say that the sketch is Stephen and then also pick him out of that lineup is ridiculous and beyond me. I mean I'm no I'm no blaming Penny because she did that. I mean she was traumatized, you know, and they're bombarding her with bombarding her with questions. She was easily manipulated for them to Plant the oh that looks like Stephen Avery, so now she's got that thought that her perpetrator is maybe called Stephen Avery, you know. Well, so, and that happened. That happened right there, you know, right after she had the hell beat out of her and and assaulted. So yeah, I'm sure yeah. that's a sticking point in her mind. Exactly, Jack. Exactly. So I am not blaming Penny whatsoever yeah. for how the photographs were done or anything like that but for for the, the the picture to be traced and it to be completely different for the lineup picture that we've just had on the screen and for her to be able to pick him out like that i just find that hard to believe and i don't know why nobody has questioned about the two different things before you know right yep yep good point uh, EBS had asked, will foul play be uploading more calls? And uh, I can tell you, not right now. However, uh, I have already sent in a complaint on this last open records request that I got. And I, I've, I've talked about this a couple of times during a couple of lives. Every I've, I've converted, and I have to convert these files. I can't just willy-nilly play them uh, i have to i have to actually use a pro an app that i got to play the call and record it while it's playing and then i convert it to an mp3 i've done about 50 of the jody jail calls and the, none of them are from jody none there's one call where steve calls on one line is the home phone Jody calls on her uh, calls Dolores on the cell phone, and she puts the phones together, and they're able to talk for I don't know three or four minutes, maybe maybe five total. That's the only uh, so far. That's the only Jody presence in these calls at all. The rest of them are calls we already have of Stephen calling mom. He calls a, um, a daddy. A uh, couple other people I think are in there as well. Other than that, so the. I don't know what the hell they did, but I sent a complaint in. I want them to review because these are not Jody jail calls. They're not. So that's what I requested. That's what I was told I was getting, and I didn't. And I've got literally hundreds of these files. I'm not kidding. There's hundreds. So before I do too many more and waste more time, they need to review exactly what uh, that they sent me. So that's where we are, EBS. Hope that explains. So, okay. 
Um, so Matt, so Matt, Matt has had a comment in the chat um, that uh, um, she that she she bet uh, Penny Bernstein felt pressured into saying that was Stephen. Well, if Michael Griesbach is to be believed, uh, and she went with uh, Bergner to see Kasser to talk about these phone calls that she'd been getting, and she didn't think it was him. I'd say there was a lot of pressure put on her because at some because at some point shortly after the thing, she was saying, "Well, you know, it might not be him because of these phone calls I'm getting," and she went to see Kasser personally, if you'd believe Michael Griesbach. I'd say that's a lot of pressure. That's a lot of pressure. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. Almost, almost believable. Almost believable that she was for, forced to tell a lie. You know what I mean? It's uh, it's very close to that in my mind. I don't, it's 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 on it's on the hairy edge. I mean, I, I would like to hear a woman's opinion on that. Um, you know uh, what? You know, th- because to, to 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 me, you know, from a guy's perspective, is she's lying through her teeth. She knew it wasn't Stephen at the point. What what's a woman's perspective on that? I think that uh, whoever said that she was under pressure to identify the guy who she was told, you know, she was told by, um, what's her name? Not my verbiage. Who said, oh, looks like Stephen Avery or sounds like. Yeah, Dvorak. Judy Dvorak. You know what I mean? And she trusts her or has trust in her. And maybe, I'm just saying, maybe Penny didn't want to, not rock the boat, but maybe she went with that. Like, yeah, it must be him. Second guessing herself or, you know, putting her intuition and putting her thinking because it's a traumatizing event aside and going with what she was told. I firmly believe in that. And then you know, she, like, I guess thank you for that. You she are. was neighbors with Kasurik. Wasn't That's she right. any person? She yes. Yes, and, and they went, and the, and they went, they went to the same church too. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. And he would have watched her heal, and if she'd been saying about these calls, and he was just telling her not like I, I consider it gaslighting. When he would know if they knew about it, so I don't know. There's something a little bit sadistic about it if it's her neighbor, and she's claiming to have these calls, and he's telling her that the you know again we've got the right guy. Don't worry yourself. Well, he's not getting the calls. There's no compassion there. Yeah. You know, uh, and Doc, I know you've got something to say. I just want to add in to what you, Big Jeff, asking for this opinion about how Penny was treated. But keep in mind, fast forward to 2005, six, and, well, almost to the end of 2006, how Fassbender, Uyghur and Fassbender went after not only them, Dettering too, went after Jody. And to me, it was it was past the point of tampering. That's just me, Doc. I was going to say at at the end of the day, we mustn't forget. No blame should be directed towards Penny, yep. and uh, Penny was actually victimized twice. Right? Let's think about it. She was victimized by a vicious sexual predator in Gregory Allen, and she was also victimized by law enforcement that should have known better. And that's why the fallout from this is monumental. And remember when Penny was told that her attacker wasn't Stephen Avery, it was actually Gregory Allen, uh, she went into a deep, deep depression. That's right. So, you know, she's been victimised again. So, you know, all this talk by the guilters about, you know, oh, come on, Stephen Avery, he's guilty of sin, etc., etc., the, the thing that you've got to remember is the potential fallout if down the track, if Stephen and, and Brendan are actually ultimately shown to have been not guilty and they didn't commit the crime, there are going to be further victims of this, right? And so, you know, we have to look at this with some sense of pity because um, Pen- what happened to Penny was horrendous and she's still paying the price. I, I completely agree. And uh, again, from my perspective, just seeing how uh, they went after and, and Jody not even being there, how they went after her to, to get her to flip on Avery, this whole it, it's it's so clear to me what they what they did and uh, what they continue to do, what they continue to do to this very day. Well, if it wasn't guilt, you know, you hear the guilty's guilt or say, well, you know, even if he didn't do that, he's guilty of something. 
He's just a bad guy. They, they don't. They don't. They have no empathy at all. But Penny did know. She understood it immediately. This guy's been locked up all these years over something that I helped do. She absolutely understood it. So, good points, folks. All right. Um, if you guys are ready, um, we can start on. Uh, this is Jennifer Nashold. And to understand her position, as I've said before, let me, let me fix this. Her position was, um, and then they're going to get more into it. I won't go into it too far in explaining it. But Deb Strauss sent her and Amy Lehman's reports to Jennifer Nashold, and that's going to come out in, in this and um, kind of start explaining the process of what they did. <laughs> uh they really pulled some some real crap here, but uh, we won't get too far into that. But uh, but Jeff, are you are you good with uh, continuing to uh, read? You want to you want to you want to do uh, Kelly or Glenn, whoever does the questioning? Yeah, I'll be glad to do that. And uh, Alice, you want to play the part of Jennifer? Yeah, sure. So our appearances are obviously uh, Glenn and Kelly, and then Covelli on behalf of, uh, as Big Jeff pointed out, on behalf of uh, Dennis Vogel and Manitowoc. Uh, Bascom, he's also on behalf of Manitowoc. Holland and Finkelmeyer, uh, on um, behalf of uh, Kasark and Manitowoc. Finkelmeyer is on behalf of, uh, he's from the DOJ, they're a lawyer. He's there to protect Jennifer Nash. And look who's present also, Steve and Jody. So Jody hadn't reported to jail yet uh, to go in, which she did a few months later. I, I think it was August, but I, I could be wrong on that. But it's near this time frame. This uh, total is, uh, it says 68 pages, but I'm going to guess it's somewhere in the 50. So we, we get to where we get to, and uh, if we have to break and do a part two to finish this one up, I, I'm okay with this. Um, okay. We're on PDF page five, line 17. Whenever you're ready, Big Jeff. Okay, so it's uh, Stephen Glenn doing the uh, inter interrogation uh, as opposed to Walt Kelly, who did it on the previous one. Correct. So Mr. Glenn. Miss Nashville. Could you please spell your name for the record? Sure. It's Jennifer Nashold. The first name is J-E-N-N-I-F-E-R. The last name is Nashold, N-A-S-H-O-L-D. And are you employed? Yes, I am. By whom? The State of Wisconsin Tax Appeals Commission. In what capacity? I am the chair of the Tax Appeals Commission. How long have you been in that position? Since June of 2004. Before that, what did you do? I worked as an Assistant Attorney General at the Department of Justice. For how long were you employed there? Over, a little over six years. Before that? Before that, I was a prosecutor at the Ada County Prosecutor's Office in Boise, Idaho. That's in Boise, Idaho, but that's fine. Which county, please? Ada. A D A. I have to ask, uh, where do you and where do an ADA in the ADA, were, were you an ADA in the, a, in the ADA? Okay, I get this. <laughs> he's trying to make a word, a word pun. So he's spelling out the, for those of you who aren't following along in the reading, saying, were you, were you an assistant district attorney ADA in the ADA? Which is ADA. Yes, I was. A, yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, Okay, and before being an ADA, ADA, what were you? 
I was a law... A student? No, I was a law clerk. Okay, for whom and when? For Judge Walters, the Court of Appeals in Idaho, and before that, for the Nevada Supreme Court in Carson City, Nevada. Okay, the questions today are going to deal with your tenure as an Assistant Attorney General, and in particular, as I'm sure you're aware, the matter of the correspondence that went uh, between the Office of the Attorney General and the Office of the District Attorney for Manitowoc County, Mark Rohr. Are you generally familiar with that? Yes, I am. Okay, I have a number of exhibits that I'm simply going to uh, hand you as a stack and just let you know in advance that we'll be going through these. Two of those documents are various iterations of this letter that was ultimately sent from the Attorney General to Mr. Rohr. You've seen that before? Yes, I have. Okay, again, generally familiar with it? Yes. Okay, come back and I may have some specific questions on it. I wanted you to start with a document that's been used as the final copy. Uh, and that's what that is, correct? <clears throat> okay. I mean, do you recognize that as the Yes, Exhibit 7. The final one, yes. The final copy, right, okay. Okay, what's your next exhibit number? Is it 23? Yes. Okay, and if I could, could I also ask you when you're referring to the documents to identify them by the Bates numbers as well? Sure. For most of them, which are photocopies, the Bates numbers will be in black. Uh, one on one on the one that's in front of you as Exhibit 23, it will be in red. Can you tell me what the beginning and closing Bates numbers are for Exhibit 23, please? Bates number 005120. What's the end number of the last stapled page? The end? In that exhibit, please. I'm sorry, the what? Last stapled page. Oh, okay. Double zero fifty one thirty four. Thank you. Can you tell me what that exhibit twenty three is? This looks like a draft that I sent to. Well, it's addressed to Stephen T Tinker and Mike Boer from me. Tom Fallon and Monica Burkett Briss. Uh, and this looks like what I said to Tom as my intentional draft or one of my drafts. And then the blue writing looks like his, whatever that feature is on the computer, where you're able to autocorrect. And basically, his comments appear in blue and orange, I believe. Wow. Uh, okay. So that's, I think we call that, uh, for people familiar with Microsoft Word, track changes. <laughs> yeah. And, and for the record and for counsel, the photocopies that we all have, unfortunately, are not color copies. And so they don't distinguish between the black type, blue type, and reddish orange type. So there will be times during the questioning of this witness that I'll have to ask her tell us what color it is and we'll just have to note it until we can make color photocopies. So, Mr. Nashhold, are you able to tell us whether that is in fact the first type draft that you would have forwarded to anyone else of this Roar report? I believe so. What factors that you see in that report cause you to believe that? Because I think I would have sent it to Tom before I would have sent it on to someone higher. Okay. Because his name is appearing on this, and I wouldn't have sent it off without his input. Exhibit 24 identified. If you could take a look just for a moment at Exhibit 24, which is, uh, should be the next one on the stack. Okay. 
And let me first ask you to note that the date on Exhibit 24, which is Bates pages 5209 to 5222, whether, the date, whether that date on Exhibit 24 is the same date as on Exhibit 23. Yes, it does. If you look at those two documents, you can see pretty quickly that they're not identical, correct? Mm-hmm. I think I'll probably serve the court reporter role here and mm-hmm you. <laughs> yes, thank you. I'm sorry. Yes, the, what was the question? Could you repeat it? Yes. That they look different, right? Yes. Yes, they look different. Again, I, I know it's difficult, but are you able to recognize Exhibit 24? That is the second, the second document bearing the 25 November date and describe it in a way different from the way you describe Exhibit 23, which also bears the November 25 date. It's like what I sent to him before he made his, before he inputted if that's a word, before he made any suggestions. And? At least. I don't need to interrupt. Oh, wait, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I take that back. This looks like. What well, could we identify it by exhibit number, please? Okay. Yeah, that's what we are. All, All right. right. All right. <laughs> uh, could, I look at this? <laughs> could I look at this for a little bit? Absolutely, sure. Okay. Take your time. Before I answer? You know, it might make sense to go off the record and let the witness look at the next couple of exhibits all at once. Okay. Back, uh, off the record and back on between 203 and 210. While we were off the record, you had a chance to take a look at the exhibits? Yes. At least those iterations of that letter uh, report to Mr. Rohr? Yes. Okay, let me ask you again. Can you tell me whether, can, can you tell me what the relationship is between exhibits 23 and 24? Let's start with that. 24. 23 is the copy of the report once Tom Fallon gave his two cents, once he told me what changes he thought should be made. And exhibit number 24, Bates 005209, looks like the draft that incorporated, for the most part, his comments. I can't tell you without talking, taking a lot of time as to whether each or every comment that he made was incorporated. Sure. But it looks like I incorporated some of those comments. Okay. Well, that gives rise to a few questions if you can, if I can. Okay. First, it sounds as though you were the primary drafter of that document. That's right. Does that mean that you took other people's sections and combined them, or did you, in fact, write a full first draft? I wrote a full first draft. That draft was compiled from what? From whatever I referenced in the report. And I believe that is, well, it's in the report somewhere, but it consisted of the investigator's reports, the DA's file, the sheriff's file, the Manitowoc Police Department's files. I also looked at the appeals to the Court of Appeals in the Avery cases. So whatever is referenced in here is what I looked at. Okay. And when you're saying in here, you're referencing the exhibits, for example, 23 and 24. Right. Did you have any notes of any people as opposed to typed reports? Notes of any people? 
Anybody, yeah, law enforcement folks, for example, law enforcement memo books, if there were such things. And when I say law enforcement now, I'm including not only the DCI people, going all the way back to the Manitowoc County Sheriff or the Manitowoc City Police Department. I believe we got their files and I, and I reviewed whatever was in the file. I didn't look at extranations information, extraneous information. Was the material that you received from the Sheriff's Department based bait stamp, uh, do you recall? I don't recall. How about from the Police Department? Do you know if that was bait stamped? I don't recall. And the District Attorney's file, same thing? I don't recall. Okay. But as you're sitting here today, do you have a recollection of seeing DCI agent reports prepared by Ms. Strauss and Ms. Lane? Yes. And do you have a recollection of having conversations with them in addition to working off the reports? Mr. Bascom, object to the form. Can you tell me what you're talking about when she's drafting this or throughout the investigation process? In, in any part of the process. Okay. At the moment. Do you understand what he's asking? with Amy and Deb, the investigators. At any time in the course of this process? Yeah. Okay. Now let me come to the drafting process. Mm-hmm. Yes. As opposed to the earlier process. Did you have conversations with them at what time? For example, would you start writing the draft, realize that you didn't have an answer to a question, and call one of them on the phone? I don't think so. I think I had what I needed from their reports. So it, uh, is it fair to say then, to summarize what you've been saying, that you don't think you had contact with anyone about factual matters other than was what was written in documents that you used in the drafting, drafting process? I don't recall if I read a report and thought, I'm unclear of what this means or anything like that. Okay. I just, I don't recall. Is it safe to say, though, that you don't, um, that also means you don't have any specific recollection of contacting anyone? That's right. During the drafting process, during the drafting process for a specific fact. Yes, that's fair to say. Okay. So if we look at 23 and 24, look at the one with the actual exhibitor sticker on as opposed to the copies that the lawyers here have what we see is that there are some items that are uh, to use a big lawyer word interlineated that is crossed out <laughs> okay uh, and they're crossed out in what appears to be uh, black ink of some sort correct yes then there are the sections that are printed in blue ink yes there are a few sections later on in that document, a little bit, I believe, where there is some red or orange ink. Is that right? Yes. Could you give me a Bates page for that, please? Double zero fifty one thirty one is the first time I see orange ink. Okay. Can you tell us what those various colors of ink mean to you? That is, are you familiar with the editing program that generates these colors of ink? I am not. I'm pretty low tech. Okay. You described that before as being something that suggested to you that uh, that meant Mr. Fallon was involved in it. Yes. Why is that? Because he's the only one that I recall giving me this amount of input into the report. All right, of course. Well, it's Patabi boy. Uh, and I mean, uh, have you seen other drafts and edits of his that would come back with this blue and no reddish orange ink? This this was my first time working with Tom on a case. Okay, but you're comfortable telling us that uh, that that's uh, that meaning uh, Exhibit Twenty Three 
is a document that began as your document with no changes, just black ink, to Mr. Fallon, where it was modified but by his use of the blue and the red or orange inks that we see in the document. Yeah, I, I do want to just look at this to see if there's any possibility that one ink is from someone else and the other ink is from another person. Okay. Okay, yeah, to the best of my recollection, both the orange ink and the blue ink is his. Okay. So, I mean, what that what that means to me is he probably took it home and did some work on his work computer and some work on his home computer, but we'll have to wait for him to find that out. Okay, ha having examined that, are you in a position to tell us what the distinction is between the use of blue ink and the use of the reddish orange ink? It looks like he might have tried to use the blue ink to indicate things that he definitely thinks should have been added, whereas the orange ink looks like more editorial stuff. Mm. But then sometimes with the, the blue ink, he says, quote-unquote, probably should use initials. So, but, you know... Just looking at it rather quickly, it looks like that's maybe why he chose two colors of ink. Okay, well, let me take you through certain segments. Sure. Well, these reports, uh, as their process, as they proceed along. First, first of all, are the reports as numbered as exhibits 23, 24, 25, and 26, in correct chronological order? That is, does it appear that Exit 26 followed uh, Exhibit 25, which is followed by Exhibit 24? Sorry, which followed Exhibit 24? It does, with the caveat that on 25, I'm sorry, did you mention 26 yet? Yes. Okay, because on 26 you have a cover page that says December 2nd, but then it looks like the rest of it is November 26th. And actually, uh, if I could invite your attention to Exhibit 25, I think you'll see the same phenomenon that the first page is November 28th, and the rest of the pages are also November 26th. Okay. Does that appear to be the case? Yes. Do you have any sense of what that is? I mean, is that simply, uh, you know, a word processing error of not going uh, up into the page and date body and changing the date there, do you think? That's what I would think. Okay, so again, is it safe for us to operate on the theory that these documents, in fact, were created on the dates um, that the front pages bear? Yes. Okay. So let me, uh, with that in mind, let me take you through a few of these things, okay? Let me walk you through, oh, a paragraph that seems to last through the first three or four drafts and then disappear. Okay. At least that's what it appears to me, and you can help me out here if I'm wrong. Looking at Exhibit 23 on the second page, which bears Bates number 5121, the third full paragraph beginning soon after the mistake became public. Okay. First, can you give me a referent for the phrase, the mistake? That is, uh, what do those two words refer to? Uh, is, is, the, is that the mistaken conviction of Mr. Avery? Yes, I would think so. Okay. And that indicates that, uh, quote, current Manitowoc District Attorney Mark Rohr began receiving information that people within the courthouse never believed these crimes were committed by Avery. Those people also believed at the time that Allen had committed the crime. Some of these individuals even stated to Roar um, that they made these concerns known to, close quote. And then at one point, it was either those names, uh, but then after, editing, after editing, it simply, quote, known to District Attorney Dennis Vogel or the Manitowoc County Sheriff Jean uh, Couchet. I'm oh, sorry, uh, uh, Sheriff Jean Kasurik, correct? Yes. Okay, now first of all, obviously this is an earlier draft. 
And uh, do you know today that Sheriff's uh, first name is actually Thomas Kasarik as opposed to Jean? Yes. Okay. That paragraph, that is the paragraph that talks about Mr. Rohr receiving uh, information from people in the courthouse is based on information that had been given to you during the course of the preparation of the report, correct? Yeah. I mean, you either had reports from Ms. Lehman and Ms. Strauss, or, or, or you had, uh, were you present for a conversation with Mr. Rohr, by the way? I was. Okay. I was present at the initial conference with Mr. Rohr, where he asked us to get involved. Well, I don't know if it was the initial one, I should say, because I don't know if he had contact with the AG prior to that point. But I was at a meeting with him before we started this. And I would uh, assume that's where that information came from, but I. I don't recall. So before you began the drafting process, you and others had a meeting with Manitowoc County District Attorney Mark Aurora, correct? That's right. And during that conversation, Mr. Rohr said things to you that would have been consistent with what's in this paragraph, correct? I believe that's where that came from. I mean, it's safe to say that if he had not said that uh, and it didn't show up in anybody's report, it wouldn't be in this document. Right. Correct. And similarly, uh, if he had said something contrary to that, you wouldn't expect that to be in this document either. Right. That is Exhibit 23, correct? Right. Okay, so when you're creating this document, that paragraph goes in. And except for some minor, uh, what I would call editorial changes, it remains uh, intact in Exhibit 23, correct? Yes. Then if you look at Exhibit 24, again, generally the same position, I'm inviting your attention to page 5210 of the bait stamps. You see that paragraph is again, uh, is intact, correct? Right. If we go to Exhibit 25, again, the second page, which is Bates uh, 5136, we see that the same paragraph, again, intact, correct? That's right. Let me go to Exhibit 26, and we look on the second page. And frankly, if, you, uh, if you'd like, you should feel free to look throughout the whole document. That paragraph isn't there. Nor is there, uh, you know, or uh, I'm asking you, is there any reference what is the subject of that paragraph? No. Exhibit 26. Let him finish the question. Sure. Okay. And the answer was no? No. Okay. Who had the authority to change your words in this document? The authority changed my words. I was definitely open to comments and discussions by the other two people who are on the report, as this being from namely Tom and Monica. But as far as just I'm going to change your words, neither one of that would be, you know, a lawyery discussion about whether my words should be changed. And as far as you know, that authority to change the report, ultimately, only the Attorney General and probably Dan Back, or someone like that. Okay, well, and I'm... Uh, as my superi superiors. Let's pause right, right okay. here. Let's pause right here at line five. Because I, I think we should, uh, you know, talk a little bit about the players involved again. And her circle, right? And I call it her circle because it's her, Jennifer, Tom Fallon, Wow, and Monica Burkhart Brist. So, um, as, as you know, I, we've already, I mean, at least from my perspective, I already got this feeling, this knowing uh, who Fallon is and, and his input and 
this tailoring of this uh, draft that ultimately went up the food chain. Just wanted to point that out. Um, and they're already talking about this document being edited and this section being removed that, that had existed all the way up to this Exhibit 26. I'll let you guys comment before we move on if you want. Let's, I mean, just, just to revisit the comment in question so people are familiar because there's a lot that happened. Current Manitowoc District Attorney Mark Rohr began receiving information that people within the courthouse never believed these crimes were committed by Avery. Those people also believed at the time that Allen had committed the crime. Some of these individuals even stated to Rohr that they made these concerns known to, you uh, know, obviously uh, Vogel is the uh, District Attorney Vogel is the is the rest, or or or, or So um, this is the beginning. You know, you, you're seeing the what 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 you're seeing is the whitewashing, and you know you'll hear very often uh, myself and Dr. Silkman call it the the peg whitewash, uh, and that's what it was. And it, you know she she was actually beginning to relay the facts, um, which, which is which is good on her. Uh, but instead, um, you know, as, as she was actually laying the facts down that were pretty harsh, that people said they didn't think it was him and they were telling Roar about it. Um, you know, he's not, we don't think that that's necessary to put in. We can just edit that out. It's not really contributing to the overall final value of the report. I mean, my assets not. It's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's really telling what people were saying and that they screwed up bad. Right. I mean, to me, that's that's the the core of the document or the or the complaint, Doc. Yeah, I, I totally agree with uh, Big Jeff. To me, what this is, and uh, I'm glad that you mentioned uh, Tom Fallon because there's no doubt this guy, he's the architect, right? Um, so essentially, what they're doing is they're sanitizing a very very damaging report. So this is really disingenuous because the fact finders are finding all the facts and writing down all the material whereas people higher up the chain who are looking at these documents are going holy shit we can't have these statements in a report because it's going to make this whole situation look even worse than what it is so what they do is they sanitize it they play it down they downplay it that's exactly what the attorney general peg l did with the final report basically yes on the outset it looked really really damaging how can we possibly dilute this and sanitize it so in effect if you've got individuals like tom fallon uh the, the guys the guy's a legal guru he knows all the tricks he knows exactly what to say and now there's even evidence of them deleting paragraphs so they are editing their own report, their own final report. Guys, you know it was going to be a shit show from the end, from start to the end. Oh, well, yeah, with his involvement? Yeah, but Jeff? It was all Penny's fault, right? It was Penny Bernstein was such a good witness, and there's no other fault found, right? I mean, we can, we can re bring up the... Uh, you know, the conclusions of the report, you know, at, at best, at the, the worst was that Alan was a viable suspect that got ignored. No, no other badness happened, period. That, that's, that's basically the report. And, it's, uh, it's... you know, B Big Jeff, you, you said the right word there. The, the actual stopping point was Penny Bernstein herself. So if there was going to be any form of criticism, harsh criticism to Kasserik, to Vogel, to Cushay, in the end, all of them would have pointed a finger at Penny Bernstein and said, well, the victim pointed out the suspect. So hence, we delivered what she reported. Now, isn't that disgraceful, right? That in the end, they had the ultimate full person, Penny herself. Oh, it's truly shocking. Anything except to blame themselves. Anything. They, okay. they, could have, they could have taken a different route, right? They, 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 could, they could have admitted culpability, right? They, they could have actually, uh, you know, tried to report the things that were done that, that, were, that were wrong. They could have attempted to clean up the system. They could have went to Kasserik or, or you know, uh, if, and, and, and sort of walk, walk frog marched him like he deserved uh, away. 
But no, what they did was they they chose the you know the the, the typical government choice, and they decided to bury it because it was just going to be too embarrassing. And that and that's what they did. Right. That's that is exactly what's going on here. Hundred right? percent so correct. Hundred percent correct. Instead of them saying we are truly sorry, we apologize. We apologize to Stephen. We apologize to Penny. We apologize to the further victims of um, Gregory Allen. They knew that they could never admit culpability because if they did, it potentially meant that some of these guys would have spent their remaining days in prison for what they did. So in a way, what we see here, and that's why I'm so intrigued, we in essence are seeing a cover-up of a cover-up. And that's remarkable. And, and keep in mind, again, I mentioned it at the beginning of this podcast, of this live tonight. At this time, they had to know by then, this is May 13th, they had to know by this time, probably, that a judge in Minnesota had signed a warrant to get Gregory Allen's DNA, which occurred about a month about a month later. So these people, you know, I, I don't know that Fallon knew. I suspect he, he very well might have because he had been at the, uh, the DOJ for a long time. Was he trusted with that information? I don't know. But if he was and he knew, it, it's even worse, really. It, it, it's much, much worse. Well, not not only that, uh, Jack sixty one, uh, and listeners in chat, but remember when we read the deposition of Tom Fallon, and one of the questions was asked of Tom, "Can you please explain what exculpatory evidence is?" And Tom Fallon gave the biggest bullshit, convoluted answer you would ever hear in your life, because he knew, he knew that if he admitted. <laughs> if he admitted that the state had exculpatory evidence that they kept to themselves, he knew that all of these guys were toast. So he could not give a straight answer to what exculpatory evidence was. To me, guys, the fix was in. The fix was in. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I remember that. Go ahead, go ahead, Big Jack. No, I was just agreeing, no doubt, that the fix was in. Yep, I, I totally agree. All right, let's, uh, let's continue on with the questioning of uh, Jennifer Nashold. So, uh, line five, Jeff. Line five. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come to that. Okay. So would it be safe to say that at least in terms of the preparation of this report, you viewed yourself, Mr. Fallon and uh, Ms. Burkett Brisk, as equals. As equals? Yeah, that you all had a chance to participate in the drafting of uh, a document before it went to management. Yes. I expect that I, Monica was not very involved with this. Okay. At all. So then let me recast my question. It would be fair to say that you and Mr. Fallon then were the primary drafters of this document, and if changes would be made, they would be discussed between you two. Yes. Either in writing, as we saw in Exhibit 23, with the blue ink and red ink, or just by conversation between you. Right. Oral conversation. And was your understanding uh, that after you folks had reached a draft that you were happy with, it would be forwarded up the chain uh, uh, in management within the Department of Justice? Yes. Let me ask with respect to the paragraph that we were discussing a few moments ago, one that begins soon after the mistake became public, and consists of comments made by Manitowoc County District Attorney Rohr. Was that a paragraph? Was was that a paragraph that was removed by you? Well, I assume so. If it's not, yes, I assume so. Uh, what's that assumption based on? Unless I see something that said, you know, that someone directed me to remove it. 
I would think that it took place as a result of my thinking that that what that that was not particularly relevant because later on I go into detail about all these people in the courthouse making these comments and that that just was background in terms of how this case came into being why we were asked to look into it look at look at this okay so am i correct in my understanding that you're saying that in the absence of a direction to you to change it you're making the assumption that any changes in here were voluntary on your part and were nothing more than editorial changes yes okay let me ask you the same thing and show you another section okay on exhibit 23 uh, why don't you go to page 5133 which is the second to the last page uh, may, which may save you some time in going through uh, from the reporter i beg your pardon second to last page yes uh, which may save you some time in going through thank you uh, could i get that sure uh, cut that copy back since uh, it's the one with, um, you know, since the one bearing the exhibit sticker is the only one that has the colored ink on it. Okay, let me hand you that exhibit back. The original draft, there was a heading eight uh, that read, because of the wrongful conviction, not only did Avery serve 18 years for a crime he did not commit, but Alan was allowed to continue with his course of criminal activity. Yes. Correct. Uh, and again, uh, so I don't have to repeat these questions throughout this deposition process, that heading is based upon your review of uh, materials that are described in the report itself, correct? Yes. Uh, and if you uh, go now to section nine on the next page, go to the second paragraph uh, of that on exhibit 23, you see that uh, in the, I'm sorry, in the last paragraph, you see that the beginning with the third sentence of that last paragraph, someone had placed a line out process in effect and stricken the following language. Uh, quote, another factor which is glaringly obvious is the manner in which Allen continually, sl continually slipped through the cracks of the criminal justice system with no one in the criminal justice system except the Manitowoc Police Department taking his conduct sufficiently seriously. His predatory acts towards women and girls were obsessive, spanned over a period of years, and included acts of violence. Society should have been, re should have been relieved from his activities sooner through stiffer charges and sentences. Did I read that correctly? Yes. Okay. Uh, is the strikeout again something that you believe comes at the hands of Mr. Fallon? Yes. Did you have a conversation with him about that? Oh, I think we talked about it in sort of a light fashion. I mean, I ultimately agreed that it should be struck and that basic... Uh, well, let me... Go ahead. Uh, let me just follow you. Well, finish. Uh, if, if you finish the answer, fine. If... Finish your answer. The answer to the question was that Tom Fallon did the strikeout. Was that your question? Yes. Okay. Okay. Is the information that is contained in the stricken portion factually accurate? Object to the form. And Mr. Covelli, object. It assumes the form of the question assumes a fact, not an evidence. Mischaracterizes the nature of the language. Okay, so I have to answer, right? This isn't like a. Yes. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. This isn't like a hearing. I've never done a deposition. But, okay, so the question is whether it's factu factually accurate. So let me look at it again. Just so I'm clear about the quest, in her opinion. Right. 
Okay. Sure. Okay. Sure. And, and obviously, based on your review of the documents that you've referenced earlier. Okay, that's fair. Okay. It's factually accurate, except that I have to say that part of the problem, I think, was that, well, two things. One is that there was not, I don't think, and I haven't done research on this, a statute that addresses the, the kind of conduct, conduct that Alan was engaged in that would have encompassed the se severity of his behaviour. So, in other words, he was continually charging with his prowling, the silly city ordinance of prowling. And I don't know that there were, they were stalking statutes available or any statute that would have addressed his conduct the way it should have been addressed. So there was that problem. And the problem that I do believe that, you know, at this time in 1985, it was just a different view of these kinds of acts. Right. And would you include within that consideration a charge of disorderly conduct, behavior, which included confronting women on, on a beach, removing your own clothing, masturbating in front of the women, and lunging at them as they ran away? With, I would have to know the facts as to whether the victim could identify the perpetrator and what kinds of... Assume the victim could identify the perpetrator. If the victim could. And did. And did. And there were no other problems with the case, then if I were a prosecutor, I wouldn't, I don't think I would reduce the charges to a disorderly. And is that what you meant in that second, uh, well, what is actually, I guess, the last sentence of the original paragraph? that makes reference to stiffer charges and sentences. Right, and that's what this, and I ultimately agree that this was, you know, my editorial. This is my version of what would have done, what I would have done if I were a prosecutor. And so I think Tom is correct that it is editorializing. This is, you know, what I would have done. And, you know, prosecutors always disagree with each other in sure. a prosecutor's office, so... Okay. But again, idea that this document would contain, oh, wish lists or edit, should be editorializing, is not so unusual in this document, is it? I mean, for example, in that same paragraph, the first sentence of page 5134 in Exhibit 23, talks about the case also underscoring the necessity of sharing information between law enforcement agencies. Mm-hmm. And that's an editorial statement as well, correct? It's, I think it's less of a judgment call. Sure, but it is an editorial statement, correct? Mr. Cobelli, I'm going to object to the form of the question. Okay. You're allowed to answer. Is it? Mr. Finkelmeyer, go ahead and answer if you understand what he's asking. Is it an editorial comment? Well... It's not a statement of fact, correct? Mr. Cobelli, objection. This is awfully leading counsel. Well, I don't know. I mean, the line between a fact that information should be shared, that just seems... Garland, that seems obvious to anybody walking into a situation, whereas the others, you know, I just, I think that's more, more a judgment call, as I said, so. 
So you think it's not as obvious as the fact that stiffer charges would be due for somebody who, while masturbating, lunged uh, at a woman on the beach? Mr. Cavalli, object, objection to the form of the question. I mean, do you think one is editorial and the other is not? Do you understand what he's asking? I mean, does, I mean, is there, I'm not sure there's a question there, Steve. Is that an objection? I'll object to the form. No. I'm sorry. I don't think you can, but. Well, that's fine. We had this discussion yesterday, but I not. So, I'm going to object to the form. You're allowed to answer. You can answer the question if you... And, and one editorializing more than the other? Yes. But I don't know all the facts of what went into the charging decision. Whereas, you know, I know the facts that went into the exchange of information. I mean, I do feel like one is more of an editorial comment than the other. Okay. Did anybody ever suggest removing the line about, uh, quote, this case also underscores the necessity of sharing information between law enforcement agencies, close quote? I don't believe so. Okay. But it is true that at some point the heading Roman numeral eight was deleted. Right, and I believe the information was incorporated elsewhere. Well, we'll come to that. Okay. You think you guys want to discuss this just for a moment before we move on? Because this yeah. is a oh, de de most definitely. Go, go ahead, big. Go ahead, big Jeff. I know you got something to say about it. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, I, I see. I, Susan has been on mute the whole cast, but her, but her and I have, uh, you know, very strong suspicions about Gregory Allen. Uh, you know, perhaps even potentially acting as an, you know, it's an, in theory, not, a, not accusation of that or anything like that, acting as a, you know, sort of a Kasarik's personal goon squad. And, and you know, maybe that, um, you know, in, in the effort to, to frame Avery, because everything happened awful fast, um, you know, was he acting as an agent of the state? Uh, and, you know, we said, well, that's an outrageous, uh, outrageously uh, inappropriate suggestion, Big Jeff. What evidence do you have of that? Well, we have this, you know, we, we, we have Vogel more than once taking uh, and reducing charges on, on, on Gregory Allen. And we're reading some of these details right now. I don't know that we had these specific details before, but he took off his own clothes. He, he, he started masturbating in front of women on the beach. And when they tried to leave, he lunged at them. Okay, and Vogel dropped those charges down to a, you know, sort of a, a disorderly conduct, right? And Jennifer Nashville, and, and even uh, Deb Strauss in her deposition earlier, she said, you know, as, as a woman, I'm very offended uh, as to, you know, as, as to what went on there. And, and you know, and, and Jennifer Nashville, even during this deposition is very clear, it's very clear that she's kind of like, you know, surprise that you know that that level of evidence was had you know she, there's this even, even though we're only reading the text i think there's a very much a uh, an intonation in the, in the in the written words there that she was kind of taken aback a little bit so um you know to, to me you know this is uh i i would love to know uh from from uh, walt kelly if they had anything uh, more that might support uh an, an, an assertion that this was just more than a than a a random attack, and I'm not even necessarily saying that that PB specifically was targeted. Just they might have said, "Okay, Gregory, have at have at it," because we got something we need done. Um, I don't know that. I can't prove that, um, and I'm not uh, accusing that. Um, but oh, oh my God, it's it, to, to me, it's awfully suspicious. Certainly, intimation there, and to uh, I see that uh, Susan has joined us. Hey, Susan, I'll get to you just here in a sec, Doc. I see you unmuted. Hi, Jack. So, I know you probably got can something you? to say. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I I agree with Jeff. I'm very suspicious of that. Um, there was something going on there with Vogel. 
um, Kasarik and Allen. Well, for him to have dropped the charges as many times as he did from prowling and, and these all these other really pretty pretty bad, pretty rough stuff that he yeah. was doing to disorderly conduct and basically he got to pay a fine and walk away. It was pretty significant. And then of course the beach attack a year prior, this not far from where Penny was attacked, it, you know, it, we did we can't prove that, you know, what were potentially could have happened, but there's certainly that intimation there. Yeah, he should have been long before uh, the attack on Penny. And he certainly should have, yeah, he, he definitely should have been a, uh, the, the number one suspect, in my opinion, and he wasn't. For, and it was sure. act, and was actually protected, so. Well, I'm glad you got to, glad got a chance to join us, so. Welcome. Yeah, I got home from work late, sorry. Yeah, that's okay. I'm oh, sorry. I had to leave for a uh, few minutes but um what was what stuck out to me and maybe somebody already said this was like they're acting like this behavior never happened before so they didn't have a crime for it you know and i i'm just kind of skeptical about that <laughs> you know well yeah that's well, where it comes I, into the the editorial housing go ahead big J. well i was, I was gonna say I, I think i think that uh that stephen glenn puts it right back in her face right when he's when he uh, says um uh you know that the, the the exchange um that goes um let me just uh scroll scroll back up to it um the one that uh, okay um you know uh and, and would that include a consideration uh of a charge for of disorderly conduct for behavior which included confronting women on the beach removing your own clothing masturbating in front of the women and lunging at them as they ran away and she said oh without knowing i'd have to know the facts right and he comes back. So she doesn't know the facts of this case, right? For for, for Gregory Allen and, 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 and Glenn comes back and says, well, assume the victim could identify the perpetrator. Well, and she, if the victim could, and, and then he comes back and says, and did. Uh, <laughs> there, right. And there were no other problems, right? And did, and did, right? So she's going, oh, okay. Well, she's kind of getting, you know, gobsmacked here right in the face by, by, by these things. So she's assuming that maybe there's some problems and you couldn't quite pin the thing on him, but um, you know, to, to, to me, I think you're right, um, uh, Shari, that, um, you know, <laughs> that there, there were indeed things that he could have been charged on. And, uh, you know, uh, that Jennifer just made some some assumptions that, uh, you know, that there were some extenuating circumstances. And I think that that she was just flat out wrong about it and got gobsmacked in these uh, last few sections, right? Those, yeah. that, that, that exchange, I thought it didn't go well for her at all. You got to wonder, and, and Doc, I'm just going to say this. You got to wonder if there were conversations between Jennifer and Tom Fallon. He's like, yeah, you know, there were issues, blah, blah, blah. And she just accepted it at face value. I don't know. Doc? Well, um, there's a lot of things to unpack here, but um, it goes to show the level of stupidity that we are seeing right here. Because quite clearly, Gregory Allen was being under surveillance. Now, normally a person goes under surveillance if there's suspicion that an individual is going to commit a crime. They clearly know that Gregory Allen was a peeping Tom involved in um, sexual crimes of a sexual nature. And isn't it very interesting how uh, Judge Patrick Willis said to Stephen Avery, uh, well, it looks like your crimes have been escalating. And yet there is quite clear evidence here that Gregory Allen's crimes were indeed escalating to the point where he had done all those horrendous things on the beach. Now, this is now blood on the hands of Vogel. Vogel should have done, under any ordinary circumstances, Vogel should have realised, uh-oh, this guy is dangerous, he's deadly, he's a sexual pervert, let's get him off the street. The actual opposite happened, and he downgraded the charge. And as a, res a, as a direct result of that, in essence, Gregory Allen's crimes did escalate, didn't they? They got worse. He sexually attacked Penny Bernston. That is a direct result of Vogel being consistently lenient on Gregory Allen. And here's my final question. 
What would have happened to Stephen Avery had he had done a similar act on the beach? In other words, done the same things as Gregory Allen did. Would have Vogel been as lenient to Stephen Avery as he was to Gregory Allen? And if the answer is no, that says a lot. Absolutely. The answer is obvious, obviously not is the answer, right? <laughs> I think that the, the, the follow-up question, the, the important follow-up question, though, is why did he break down those charges? Why, why did he lower those charges? Uh, correct. For, and uh, for I agree. Reason? Yep, I agree with what you said. I reckon he's a confidential informant. Um, there's something that's definitely going on between him, Vogel, and likely Kaseric as well. Because if you keep on committing these crimes, um, people people know people know that in, in the end your your crimes are going to escalate, right? And the question is, why was someone like Gregory Allen kept on the street, right? And so you now have this ridiculous nature whereby Tom Fallon can't answer a question what um, exculpatory evidence is. And now you've got all this editing occurring within a document in order to downplay the seriousness of what occurred. Guys, my mind is blown. This is stupid. Absolutely. You know, and I'm I'm also curious now thinking about camp and it would take some getting some documents if we could even get them thinking back to that time frame other people in that region that Bogle and you know the sheriff's department and so forth had on their radar and had been charged and convicted of prowling i'd be curious to know uh, if there are others and how the how those cases were handled big joe uh, i'd be curious to know uh if, if there are such cases in the vicinity of the hallback murder then to be honest um, yep. If if, if what, it, how, how far of it is this, how far of a stretch is it? Now, I'm going to put this in the form of a question, but there's a clear insinuation. If you can come to the conclusion that um, that Greg, Gregory Allen is potentially, you know, in theory, not making an accusation, sort of uh, Kasarik's personal goon squad, and when, when that something needed to happen, he called up his goon squad and, and made it happen. Uh, there's a guy by the name of Dave Bogatka who, you know, they're talking about in the chat right now. Uh, somebody came to his bar. He said he had a couple of the cops. Somebody came to his bar when he was on vacation and killed the bartender. That 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 was there. I don't think that was a you know was was that who 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 did that? He has his opinions about about who did that, and I know that his you know he uh, his stories have changed over time. Um, but to think that you know people that powerful people don't have goon squads is uh, you know who, who go to who, who go to deep ends. That's that's wrong headed thinking. Um, so. Uh, you know, it's, it's it's not a far cry to believe that, uh, you know, um, there may have been some type of, uh, you know, two, two shots in the head is, is a, to me, says a hit. Two in the hat. That's what they used to say in the Boston mob. <laughs> well, so, um, we have to wonder. Why, yeah, we have to wonder why this surveillance of Gregory Allen was suddenly yanked at this opportune or misopportune time for Penny at this specific time. It, it does raise questions. We don't have any proof, but it's certainly the insinuation, right? It has to be. We have to look at that. Yeah, I agree. And uh, we, we saw in the Deb Strauss uh, um, something that, that I hadn't realized before. You know, you read it's, it's good to go over these things multiple times because you, know, you pick up something new every time. The surveillance window for Gregory Allen was, was actually very short. Uh, and it was it was uh, only through what August second something like that it ended it was only it, only, it was only like a week and a half before yeah. and ended on August second and the crime was the 29th right so, right. so it was it, so what, why why did that why did that surveillance stop yeah that is, that is another uh, really key question and uh... yeah that's one of my biggest questions is why was he being tailed and watched right up until that day and then all of a sudden the police are called off to stop yeah. watching him yeah because and that's then, the, he, he wasn't going to stop right alice he was not going to stop no 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 somebody like that does not stop um and we we jeff saying um we, yeah you learn you learn things and everything like that when you look into it yeah no 
dumb people learn things, Jeff. When they, when you actually look into it, um, there is people out there that come up with ridiculous notions, um, and claim it as evidence, um, but they don't show you that evidence, you know. Um, whereas everything that we've done, uh, some some of us have been on it for six years or more. And everything that we've done and say is based on facts, documents, phone calls, and everything like that. And I'm sorry, but there is a hell of a lot more information pointing to Brendan's innocence and Stephen's innocence than there ever has been of actual evidence that they committed this fucking heinous crime. Well, there's, um, an, there's another aspect of this, too, that it's kind of the unspoken thing. And that is, we see an event happen, but then we see something else that happens later on that it has to be connected. We don't have the middle part, but to make that, I mean, and I'm going into speculation and even theory, but the the reason, as Big Jeff often says, the reasonable person, how would that, how would that connection be? It's certainly... Yeah, there's times I guess it could be some kind of a weird outlandish thing, but most of the time you got to use a reasonableness uh, in making these connections. And with Greg, curious to yep. what tailed means to all of you, because tailed, when I hear he's being tailed, they were after him 24 hours a day, seven days a week. He left his house. He was they were on his ass. He was at his house. He was on his ass. When I read the reports from Manitowoc Police Department, that is not the take I get. I get that they were driving by his house two or three times a day to make sure that he was there or whatever. They weren't like tailing him. And at that evening, instead of doing a drive by to see if he was there, they ended up having another call they had to go on. So they weren't able to drive by his house at that time. Like that's, I don't like for tailed for me, it seems like that's the wrong word to use. Maybe, you know, maybe we need a, I don't know. Maybe Saprakop would could give us a, a better understanding because it, that does beg the question uh, being tailed or being surveilled. And to me, that's that's two different things, right? Being tailed right. means that they're keeping tabs on you kind of best they can. Surveil means they're watching your ass constantly. So being tailed might, is just them driving by, taking tabs every now and then. But surveillance would be them on his ass all day. Because I have it differently. Like, I would put it tail being if they're on his ass. They're tailing him. They're on his ass all day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We need to understand the terminology. Yeah, go ahead, Alice. They're stopping inside his house. They're, if he goes out to the shop, they're following him. If he, you know, if he goes out and drives his motor, then they're following him and everything like that. But if you're being surveilled, I mean... That could mean many things. That could mean the same thing. Is he being surveilled all the time? Are they following him? Are they going to the shops when he's going to the shops? Are they sitting outside his house watching him 24-7? So, yeah, maybe ask Sapa what the actual, what he thinks the distinction between the two are. You know what I mean? Because to me, in part, they're still the same thing, tailed and surveilled. The if you're surveilling them, you're following their every movement. If you're tailing them, you're following their every movement. So maybe that's just me, but maybe it's a good idea to get with him being um, an ex-police officer. Maybe it's a, a good idea to get a distinction in what he thinks the difference is between them. Yeah, Maz asked a question. Didn't uh, law enforcement show up mega quick after the PB attack and... Um... As I recall the sequence of events, there were some people on the beach that she came out of the woods and some people on the beach found her. And, and around that time, the cops showed up. I, I, but I can't remember. Um, I don't know if I don't know if Tom, the, the husband, um, I'll say Tom. Uh, Penny's husband. Had already called the police, alerted them. I, I don't remember if anybody can recall those sequence of events. Good question, Maz. I don't think it was long. I think that it was relatively quick, however that happened. The, 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 I think he went down to look for her, did he not? Her husband? And then we were on the scene. I, I can't yeah. remember. I, I'd have to I'd have to relook at the, the, the reports. I, I can't remember yeah. the exact sequence of events, but... 
I, I don't think it was long. No. Okay. Um, let's. Um, so so I, just one, one more one more thing. We, we we you know one more thing about this so the last section that we've read. So, so one one important thing with regard to the document that they that they've talked about is they actually have they, they actually deleted a section. Uh, and uh, I encourage everybody to go to the the file play website. And download the Penny Whitewash document because I'm pretty because I'm pretty sure it's there. Yeah. Uh, and uh, in the orig in the original draft, um, there was a, a a major section. They you know they, they did it by Roman numerals. If you're reading it along with us, um, you see uh, you know Roman numeral eight, Roman uh, you know Roman numeral nine. And that's how they numbered them. They numbered that the Roman numerals were numbering the major section, uh, and uh, the major sections had these hypotheses. And there was a section eight that read. Because of the wrongful conviction, not only did Avery serve 18 years for a crime he did not commit, commit, but Allen was allowed to continue his course of criminal activity. That that is a that was a major section title, and and of course Fallon, oh no, no no no, we can't we can't have that because that is much too uh, makes it look like there was a big mistake on the government's part. Uh, we can't have that, so that that's that's got to go. So just deleting this major section. Um, and uh, of course, uh, you know, there, and they had good reason to put Gregory Allen uh, away from not one but at least two major offenses like the one we read about. Yeah, the the implication he he there's no way that uh, Fall, uh, Fallon wanted that in there. No way he, he would. Uh, my God, the implications then, of that. Of course, Jennifer Jennifer just said I believe it was incorporated elsewhere in the report, which it certainly was not. That's right. It was not. Yeah, there's no way they wanted Gregory Allen uh, highlighted that significantly, significantly in this document that Peg was ultimately going to submit. No way. Yep, I agree. Okay. I, 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 one of the, one of their big points was that the lack of communication between the departments when you have the Manitowoc. PD going to he went to Kasurik, right? That's right. Tom Bergner. With Tom Bergner, yes. Yeah. I mean that was di that was direct interaction <laughs> between yes. the two departments. That's right. And and also Vogel was uh, people in Vogel's office were telling him directly, um, this doesn't sound like Stephen Avery, this sounds like Gregory Allen. Because they saw Greg Allen come in all the time to see Vogel, so quite clearly the red the red flags were there very early on, and nothing was acted upon. And they these people and these girls in the office knew of all these cases, right, Doc? I mean, he was he was prolific. Yes, because, yes, because they kept on seeing him go and speak with uh, Vogel in his office, so they clearly knew what he looked like, uh, and they also understood what his mo was. And speaking of MO, isn't it interesting how Sandra Morris, remember what Sandra Morris said? Oh, Stephen Avery used to be undressed, naked, and masturbating on the hood of a car. That's right. Wow. And now you have a look at the MO of Gregory Allen. That's right up his so alley. You yep. You this is exactly what Gregory Allen used to do. And you, you one wonders whether Sandra Morris was actually describing Gregory Allen. Now, don't laugh. Don't laugh because if the two look fairly similar from a distance, hey, it could have well been Gregory Allen. I think it was. I, I really do. I think, I think it was. You go. Yep. That's his MO. I've thought that for years because it seems to fit the time frame in the mornings when he's exposing himself as well. Uh, and somebody did something about the Sandra Morris incident and where, which way she would have travelled and I'd like to see if they could maybe cor like if how it would correlate to where he was doing the crimes. You know, at the bus stop, he was exposing himself to schoolgirls and things. He was. Yeah, dreadful, yeah. and that was like really early in the morning. Correct, uh, and and like, you know what? It's probably a small number of these uh, sexual predators that are committing the majority of the crimes, right? And so, if the Manitowoc Police Force have have got um surveillance on him uh, they're concerned they're very very worried because 
uh, a surveillance takes a lot of resources and time and money. And the mere fact that they pulled the surveillance on that day and the horrible act occurred against Penny, uh, that's just a tragedy. And the question must be asked, why did that happen? Why did they pull surveillance? Uh, even if they were keeping tabs, you know, they knew what kind of guy this uh, uh, Alan was. They knew. So, yeah, to me, it, I mean, Jinx has got a point. I mean, uh, and I, I get it. And we do need uh, somebody like Saprakop to maybe uh, make the distinction of what they really meant. And I don't know, maybe we need more uh, documentation to what they were really doing. Don't know if we can ever get that, but um, I, I would like to understand it. I really would. Hey, uh, you know, speaking of understanding, Susan, go ahead. I just want to say bottom line of this whole whitewash report is that the state of Wisconsin just completely fucked Stephen Avery. Yes. Out of his wrongful conviction. Absolutely. And didn't give a shit uh, about and, and did, didn't give a shit about railroading Brendan. Doc. Correct. And just to add to that, Susan, you, you imagine if you're the Manitowoc police and you keep on arresting um, Gregory Allen, and Gregory Allen keeps on being released by um, um, the DA, you must be shaking your head thinking, oh my God, what the hell are we doing this for? Every time we keep arresting Gregory Allen, a Vogel just keeps on downplaying his charges and releasing him. So in the end, you, you must wonder, did they just ac absolutely just give up on this? It's completely crazy. They keep on arresting him, they downplay the charges, and he's on the street again. You know they had to be talking about it. Some of these guys were like, this guy's a, a, a freaking maniac, and the DA won't do shit about it. He just keeps reducing the charges, he pays a fine, and he's back on the street. Correct. And that now starts to point fingers towards Vogel. Was there something going on between Gregory Allen and Vogel? Had to be. Did Gregory Allen? Yep. Did Gregory Allen have some potentially compromising pictures? And don't laugh because remember, he is a peeping Tom. And all he had to do was go around Vogel's place one night or whatever or follow him with a camera. And that's it. Once you've got that incriminating evidence that you can use against someone in authority and power, you're screwed. They're screwed. I, I always thought he could have been a facilitator for them as well. It's like a connection to the underworld, whether it was just criminal activity or maybe narcotics or something like that. Possibilities are there. And he could have got him in a compromising situation that way. You know? Well, I mean, you know, uh, as Sunshine Christina has pointed out, uh, Vogel's wife's family had mega bucks. And, you know, guys, from our experience with people with a lot of money, they, they have other interests that... <laughs> Most of us just don't have that, and sometimes that goes into the, some of the really what we would consider. Uh, uh, hey, you, did, you know, people do whatever they want. I don't care. It doesn't involve me as long as it's legal. Uh, I don't really care, you know, in the connection and in, in our relevance to this. But who knows? Maybe Alan did have something. Something was damn sure going on. Makes a good point. Uh, if, if you look to the Whitey Bulger case, uh, yes. Whitey Bulger was a Whitey was a confidential inform informant, but what he was doing was he was he was ratting out anybody who was giving him any competition and letting the cops go and uh, you know the uh, actually the FBI under his under his childhood friend, um, I think the guy's name is John Connolly, right? And was go taking out was was going and taking out anybody that was giving Whitey any problems. <laughs> And why he was doing some uh, yeah. pretty, pretty, pretty rough stuff too, illegal stuff, and he got away with it. He sure was, but uh, that's that's sort of the nature of the beast of being the CI, right? I mean, so they, yep. they, they could have been there. There is something that they could have been getting from him. So I think she's absolutely right. Yeah, that what that case there is that that's one of the one of the first major ones that I ever really looked at as far as true crime. Holy cow! There's problems in multiple different law enforcement agencies with that case. But uh, I digress. Hey, that's Clairview. Hey, thanks for coming, Claire. See you there. A few others. But uh, anyway, I wanted to ask Big Jeff. Yeah, I know you've got work. So um, I'm going to let kind of let this uh, fall on you as to how much further you want to go with this document. If you need to go, then uh, we can 
end it here, or if you've got a few more minutes, we can read a little bit more and end it. Yeah, I've got a few, few more minutes and we maybe get to the next major topic. These are all interesting topics because I have not been through this with a level of detail. Uh, yeah, so this is very interesting to me. All right, so um, we're on, um, we're at line six here. Are you, are you in place, Big Jeff? You know where you're at? Uh, no, I, I might have lost my mind. I'm on line five of page 34. What, what, what PDF page are we on? It's PDF page 34. 34, okay. Line five of that? Line six of that. Okay. Line, line okay. six of that, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Uh, and did you believe that the thoughts that you had uh, attempted to convey in Roman numeral eight would still remain within the document somewhere? Now, if you're, you're on the prior page, we've already read that. That's, that's page 34. Oh, page 33? You mean 35? Uh, it's 34 in mine, as the PDF page. Now, if you look at the upper right-hand corner of the, of the actual page, it's page 33. 30, see there? Okay. See, you on, see you on the screen there? 30, 33, upper right-hand corner. 33, yeah. And we're on line six? Correct. Yeah. Let me move to exhibit 24 for a moment. And, and exhibit 24, it's relatively close to exhibit 23. Would you agree? I mean, uh, 23 as modified? Yes. One thing that happens in exhibit 24 is that section heading eight, uh, Roman numeral eight, disappears, correct? Roman numeral eight, yes. And as a matter of fact, not only did the heading disappear, but the entire section disappeared, correct? Right. We can tell that it must have been there at one time because the next section is Roman numeral nine, even though there is no longer. Okay. Roman numeral eight, correct? Yes. Okay. So is that another one of these changes that was suggested by Mr. Fallon and adopted by you? Wasn't this the one we just talked about? <clears throat> well, we just talked about the last paragraph of the conclusions, which is in section nine. Right. Okay. Yeah, we, yeah. So Roman numeral eight was removed and it was due to a discussion on the part of Tom and I. Did you believe that the thoughts that you had attempted to convey in Roman numeral eight would still remain within the document somewhere? Yes. <clears throat> and can you tell me where in the, let's say, Exhibit 24, those thoughts are found? Okay. If, in fact, I can, uh, let me invite your attention to the first paragraph of Section 9 on page 5222. Right. That's what I was looking. Okay. Yeah. I think that was incorporated in the first paragraph of Section 9. And then, as far as the facts in that, well, there is a part in the final report that just discusses all of the crimes that Alan committed after, after the conviction of Mr. Avery, right? Well, can you find for me in Exhibit 7, which is the final draft, a reference to the same kinds of points that are being made in Exhibits 23 and 24 with respect to Alan... Uh, with, with respect to had Alan been convicted of crime, as he should have, he would not have been able to commit the subsequent sexual assaults and other crimes he committed in the decade from 1985 to 1995 when he was finally convicted. Okay. It looks like I was confusing his crimes leading up. His crimes before the crime that we are talking about today involving the one that Mr. Allen was convicted of I'm confusing. Mr. Avery. Mr. Avery, that Mr. Avery was convicted of. I'm confusing those with the ones that occurred after. So I'm sorry, but this was a long time ago. Sure, but, but let me just ask you. Okay. Can you find an exhibit seven? Any reference to that thought that you had conveyed in each of the prior drafts of this document? 
You want me to go through each draft and find that thought? Cut out again. Uh oh, I think we may have lost Big Joe. No, I'm, I'm, I'm here. I didn't hear Alice uh, finish this, finish the uh, question. Oh, okay. Oh. Um, so, yeah, line, so line, 21. Line, line 21, yeah. No, just go through Exhibit 7 and find that thought, which is Exhibit 7 is the final version of this. Okay. Do you want me to go off the record? I I recall seeing... Well, let me stay on the record for a minute. Sure. Just walk you through this for a second. Okay. Okay. Exhibit 23 we've already talked about. That's the one that originally had Roman numeral 8, and then that disappeared by the time we get... Okay. Exhibit 24. Mm-hmm. But instead, in Exhibit 24, with the conclusion section... Okay. In the first paragraph, there was a reference to Allen's not being allowed to commit subsequent assaults, etc. Okay. Correct? Mm-hmm. Okay. That's on page 5222 of Exhibit 24. Right. Now we get to Exhibit 25. At page 5148, the last page, we see again as the last sentence in the first paragraph, a reference to Alan being stopped from committing these sexual assaults and other crimes for a decade, right? Mm-hmm, right. So when we go to the fourth and arguably, arguably fifth drafts of this, which exhibit 26, we again go to the last page, which is Bates 5162, and we see the last sentence of the second paragraph, again, making reference to Allen's continuing to commit sexual assaults and other crimes from 85 to 89 when he was finally convict convicted. Okay. Right. Then, well, first of all, are you aware of any drafts uh, between this December 2nd draft and December 17th, which is the date of the final version? No, I am not. So we've seen then that throughout Exhibits 23, 24, 25, 26, that that language continued. Okay. okay. Uh, let me show you Exhibit 27, which is one of the emails that you have before you, uh, and ask you to switch to that for a moment. I'm sorry, what exhibit? Exhibit 27. 27, okay. It appears from looking at this, that this is an email, actually a couple of emails between yourself and Michael Bauer, E-A-U-E-R, correct? Yes. Who is Mr. Bauer, please? It's been a while since I've been a <laughs> DOJ, the Administrator of the Division of Legal Services. Is that the position he held in 19... Yes. I'm sorry, in 2003? Yes. Okay. And why was your document going to him for his review? He's sort of the next in the chain of command. What chain of command had been established and by whom for this document? I don't remember it officially being established. I just know that it would be very rare for me to go directly to the Attorney General or the Deputy Attorney General. Why would this go to the Attorney General or the Deputy Attorney General? I mean, I take it that it's because of the chain that was established. Well, the, I think we all understood that the report would ultimately go out by the Attorney General. Is that something that came up in the very first sessions dealing with the creation of a response to Mr. Rohr's request? I don't recall. Maybe it was just an Im implicit understanding. At any rate, at all times in your drafting process, you were aware that at some stage this would hit the desk of the Attorney General, correct? 
I think so. Okay. And if it's going to hit the desk of the Attorney General, uh, you would figure that naturally it would go through Mr. Bauer. Right. Okay, so there's a reference in your email message of December 2nd, 2003 at 1046 that begins by saying, Mike, uh, you said your edits were, were suggested. Did I read that correctly? Yes. Okay, does that mean there was an earlier email from Mr. Bauer uh, to you referring to su suggested edits? I would assume so. Okay. And uh, and what what you do in the balance of your December second email is explain why it is that you did certain things, correct? Okay. Is that right? Yes. What you're talking about in this, uh, well, it's not indented. It looks like it's a smaller, tight paragraph. Is you are defending essentially your decision to place into this report the language that we've been talking about. That is, if Alan had been convicted for this crime, he wouldn't have been able to commit subsequent assault assaults for the next decade, etc. Okay. Is that right? Yes. Does that suggest to you that this was not at all removed uh, by you and Mr. Fallon, that was in fact still in the document as of December when it went to Mr. Bauer, that it was Mr. Bauer that suggested that this be deleted because well it was because it was speculative. It says, quote, second in my conclusion, you wanted me to delete the following because it was speculative, unquote. Then I have this, quote, had the sheriff's department taken more time in exploring, unquote. Blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, it looks like he asked to have it deleted. And I mean, one of those things that you're talking about here is why it is that you consider that to be important, correct? Yes. To quote your language appearing, appearing on 5165, Alan was able to commit some very horrible crimes over an extended period of time, 10 years, because of the wrongful conviction. Another reason to take care to get the right guy from a law enforcement slash prosecution perspective. Right. That was really sort of the second reason. Uh, and that the, the first reason that you thought it was important for this to be in here was to convey the thought that, again, using your words, quote, main problem here was that the sheriff's department didn't take enough time before putting together the photo array and lineup. Correct? Check to the form. That's the other reason that you were using. True? Uh, Mr. Baskin, object to the form. Uh, you may answer. Okay, yeah, it speaks for itself. And the answer is? The answer is that, yeah, I'm saying that these are the two reasons I thought the paragraph was important. Okay, uh, and in an effort to uh, essentially to make peace with the superior, you agreed to consider a change in language. Mm hmm. Did I mean correct? Y yes, I did. When you made that change, you rewrote another paragraph, and those changes appear in bold print on pages 51. I'm sorry, uh, on. Singular page 5166, correct? At the top of 5166? Yes, uh, and at the end of the third paragraph on 5166. Yes. Again, the language at the top of page 5166 deals with the Sheriff's Department taking time, which was one of your concerns. Right. And at the end of the paragraph, and at the end of paragraph three on 5166 addresses the issue of Allen not being convicted and sentenced and therefore being allowed to continue this predatory assaultive behavior on for another decade, correct? Yes. So that's when you respond. So that's what you responded to Mr. Bauer with after he asked you to take another look at your document, correct? 
Right. He said it was speculative, apparently. And so I thought that, yeah, he had a point. Who knows what would have happened had Alan been in the photo array or in the lineup? We don't know. So I incorporate, incorporated that idea that, yeah, uh, you know, it would have definitely increased the chances. No doubt about that. Because you can't have her identify Alan if he's not there. But we don't know what would have happened. Right. We don't know what would have happened if he had been charged. Uh, we don't. Uh, we can't speculate about anything. But what we do know is that he couldn't have been identified in a photo lineup if his photo wasn't in that lineup, correct? Right. He couldn't have been picked out of a physical lineup if he wasn't in the physical lineup, correct? Right. He couldn't get charged if he didn't have the victim identifying him in all likelihood, correct? Right. Now you thought it was important that those events be described, that is, the physical lineup, the photo lineup, the opportunity to consider this and not move quite so quickly, correct? Yes, and I also wanted to convey the fact that not that there were two lines of tragedy here that there was the wrongful conviction of Mr. Avery, and there was this other thing that I felt was being ignored, and that was that other people were victimised. That's right. I mean, because in point of fact, this Allen fellow physically assaulted, beat, and raped a woman within the 10-year period that you're talking about, correct? I mean, you knew of that uh, as of the time you were drafting, that you were drafting this document, is that right? If it's in my report, I don't... Okay, you, you, were, uh, you were aware that Mr. Allen was continuing to engage in the sort of behavior that he had engaged in, the, in prior to the assault of Ms. Burns. Yes. Okay, so we have in the 5165 and 5166 version of your email, your effort, as we've already indicated, to respond to Mr. Bauer's suggestions. Right. Right. Uh, and so you send uh, that off to Mr. Bauer and on December 3rd at 10.55 a.m., Mr. Bauer sends you an email back, correct? And that's, uh, I'm inviting your attention to 5165, which is the first page of Exhibit 27 at the top of that page. Yes. What Mr. Bauer says in response to your suggested changes is, those changes look fine, correct? Yes. And did you understand him to be referring to any particular changes? I just thought it was a stamp of approval for everything I had said in my email. Right. So as of now, December 3rd, having gone through the iterations that we've discussed at greater length than anybody should have to spend on one document, you end up with a document uh, which you believe is going to include language that you think is very important. That is language with respect to two points. First, the rush on the lineup of photos and at the lineup of people. And second, the failure to stop a perpetrator who was engaged in vicious and violent assaults against women, correct? I believe so, yeah. Your understanding was, at least as of that time, that the that, that had the blessing of the head of the Division of Legal Services. Is that what it's called? Right. Okay other contact with anybody in the world about changes to your document before exhibit exhibit seven which is the final version no what was made to you i don't think so not that i recall so i mean and, and I, I take it uh, i don't know if we've established this yet have you gone through exhibit seven to see if it contained anywhere in that document that there's a reference uh, there uh to if there, there's a reference to Mr. Allen's being allowed to continue his predatory behavior for another decade? When I read this document before coming here today, I thought that it conveyed that. And I just feel like I'm taking up a lot of time sitting here reading it all again to find out where that is. When I look through it just briefly now, I find on page... This is Exhibit 7, double zero, double zero 50, 40. So the last page, quote, 
Not only does this help assure that innocent people are not convicted of crimes they did not commit, but it also helps prevent the guilty from continuing a course of criminal conduct, unquote. So I don't know if that was in the other drafts, and I'm not sure if that's where I left, if that's the reason that I left this, left this document after reading it recently. The final version, thinking that mess, thinking that that message had been conveyed, there might be the other things in the report. If you want me to read through it word by word, I will now. But that, I think that conveys the idea that there might be other references as well. That is, you're satisfied as the drafter of this document the language you've just read is replacing the language as had been in every other draft, including the language that you attempted to defend in your email. Uh, yeah. Objection to the form of the question. Oh, I am a spirited person. I certainly would have used more colorful language if I had my truthers. Let me switch to something else that was a fighting point, apparently. Well, that's too strong. Uh, that was a discussion topic during the drafting of this document. You recall that there were disagreements among various members of the chain of command in the Roar report over whether there should be a paragraph that essentially attacked the defense lawyers for Mr. Avery, the public defender, and the lawyer that replaced the public defender when she took ill. Uh, and that had to do with the fact that there was at least a reference to uh, Mr. Allen that was found in some of the documents that were apparently attributed or at least assigned to the defense team, correct? Yes. Objection to the form of the question. I understand the topic that we're discussing here. Uh, that is whether or not there should be a paragraph that went through after the defense lawyers for, for not doing something about that Allen reference. Yeah, I recall. Okay, and again, if you take a look at Exhibit 28, do you have that handy? Yes. Right here. Okay. We have on page 5004, you are discussing whether such a paragraph should be in or not, correct? Around the middle of the page. Okay. Then you have some possible language that could be utilized if people chose to utilize that language, correct? Yes. And in describing your mental process in preparing this report, you indicate why it is that you didn't originally include that sort of paragraph, correct? Yes, I say that I assume there was a meeting. There's going to be a meeting. Well, let me invite your attention to a sentence that's roughly in the middle of the first... Uh, oh, I see, okay. ...full paragraph. I, I didn't include it original a quote. I didn't include it originally because I didn't want to suggest that it's defense counsel's responsibility to investigate subjects or prove innocent, close quote. And then you continue by saying, quote, but I'm but I've been having second thoughts or at least think it's worth throwing out there. Close quote. Mm -hmm. You didn't mean to suggest that you were having second thoughts about whether it's defense counsel's responsibility to prove innocence, did you? No, but I remember that Risa, was that her name? Yes. That she had actually written the Sheriff's Department's, she had actually written the Sheriff's Department asking them to investigate a suspect. And, you know, why not Alan? Why didn't she ask them to investigate Alan? And if I were a defence attorney, I'd be trying to tell the jury that there were other reasonable suspects out there or more likely suspects. Certainly, it's the prosecutor's responsibility to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. But it's the defence attorney's job to defend their client in whatever way makes sense. And that that would be a way that would make sense to me. So I take it when you say that Risa did something that's based on your recollection of materials that are described in the report. Right. You didn't, for example, 
asked the agents to go back and talk to Risa and ask her why she didn't do that, did you? No. I don't think so. I'm not aware of anyone else asking any agent to go back and conduct any re-interview of anyone in this entire case, are you? I don't remember asking them to do that. Nor do you recall anyone else ever asking an agent to do that, do you? No, I don't recall that. I don't recall seeing any reports, or, or do you, uh, in which an agent said upon a re-interview of Witness X, Witness X said such and such? I don't recall any re-interviews. Now you understand that in the criminal justice process, the burden of proof lies on one side and only one side. You know that. Right. You know that the burden of proof continues throughout the course of the trial, even if the defense chooses to put on witnesses. You know that. Sure. And you also know that it's not the defense's obligation to investigate suspects. That's what law enforcement does, correct? Mr. Cavalli, I'm going to object to the form. Well... Do you understand that it's not the defense's responsibility to investigate sub suspects, but rather it's law enforcement's obligation? Uh, Mr. Cavalli, again, object to the form. I have never been a defense attorney, so I don't know how much they start looking at other possibilities to tell you the truth, I would think they would. I mean, that just seems like a different question than who bears the burden legally at, at a trial. I mean... It is. I will agree it's a different burden and a different question, and it's intended to, it's intended to be a different question. Okay. I'm not asking you what the legal standard is for guilt or innocence. I'm asking you, as a lawyer who has been a prosecutor, been a law clerk, now is uh, now is in some at least quasi-judicial capacity, whether it is your understanding of the American criminal justice system that it is defense that it is defense counsel's responsibility to investigate suspects, whether it is. Uh, yeah, Mr. Cavalli, objection. Yeah, Mr. Cavalli, objection to the form of the question. I mean. Okay, as you understand, I take it that district attorneys have the power to subpoena witnesses uh, to their offices, and defense lawyers do not. You're aware of that in Wisconsin. Right. I'm also aware that if a witness chooses not to cooperate with a defense lawyer, there's nothing the defense lawyer can do. Whereas the witness chooses not to cooperate with a prosecutor, the prosecutor can subpoena that person his or her office, correct? Yeah. The person can be called before a John Doe investigation if a prosecutor wishes to, correct? Right. The person refuses to answer questions asked by a defense lawyer, a defense lawyer can do what? Well, ask again i mean i yeah i know what you're saying if they refuse to answer the defense lawyer has no tools available to force an answer correct outside the context of a trial <laughs> right In the investigative phase which is right what we're talking about here, prosecutors have the power to grant immunity to witnesses and compel answers from them, correct? Yes. That is to force them to give up their constitutional right to remain silent. That's a power that exists only in the office of the prosecutor, true? Yes. So when you said you didn't want to suggest that it's defense counsel's responsibility to investigate suspects or prove innocent, you meant that, true? Yes, yes, but yeah, 
And then the second part of the sentence I meant too. That is, you had been having second thoughts about whether defense counsel should have to investigate suspects and prove innocence. No, just, I guess the, I had been having second thoughts about whether to include that because I did think that some of the blame in this case went to the defense attorneys. Jesus Christ. You know, up up until this point, I had actually been getting the feeling that uh, that Jennifer Nashville is you know is a is a person of integrity. I absolutely she, she, she wanted to include this stuff in the stuff. One, she I absolutely one hundred percent agree with you. I was thinking exactly the same thing, Big Jeff. You know, until this thing about the defense attorneys, I, I I don't know, but she did she didn't put it in. It, it didn't go into the, the final report. So maybe she talked herself on it. So, uh, okay, ultimately that language did not make its way into the final drafts, correct? Right. Uh, and it did not make its way into the report itself either, correct? I... Into the Exhibit 7. I thought there was a reference to the defense attorneys not... Defense attorneys not following up or something. Oh, let me. But. Let me just ask the easy question. Okay. Paragraph that begins at the bottom of 5004 and extends to 5005. Paragraph is not in Exhibit 7, is it? That's right. Okay. The drafting of this report was done under a provision of the Wisconsin statute, statutes that allow the Attorney General's office to help a district attorney if a district attorney seeks that assistance, correct? I believe so. Do you have any participation in the decision to rely on that statute as, dirt, as, a, as the jurisdictional toehold for the Attorney General's office to be involved in this matter? No, and that's why I said, quote unquote, I think so because I wasn't involved in that decision-making process. This is not an evaluation or an investigation. Well, let me take that back. Is this report, the report of an investigation that is carried out by an independent body, or is it rather the report under the statute of one prosecutorial arm assisting another prosecutorial arm of the state at the request of the second prosecutorial arm? That is, a report of the Attorney General assisting the Manitowoc Country District Attorney at the District Attorney's request. It's a mouthful, that one. Mr. Cobelli, object to the form of the question. I'm going to join in in that light of her prior answer. Do you understand what he's asking? Yes. Okay. And the answer is, I don't know. Okay. So you weren't concerned because it was within your area of responsibility as to whether or not the Attorney's General Office had the authority. Right. To engage in this. Other people had made that decision and you were simply carrying it out, correct? Right. Okay. Uh, I, I think that's all I have, uh, just a moment. Could we take a break for a moment? Mr. Finkelmeyer, yeah. Could we go off the record? And then the- Off the record. Off the record, this is it. And as far as I'm remembering, I'll take a quick look. I'm 99% sure she was not recalled. Yeah, I don't think she was recalled to finish. Uh, let me take a quick look here. Let me close this. Oh, you know what? I can just yeah, do it this as, way. As, you, as you're looking, I, I would, you know, even ex excluding that, you know, that, that last uh, comment about wanting potentially considering throwing in something about the defense lawyers. 
I don't think that she was necessarily a very good uh, witness for the uh, for the state. And you could you know you could see some of the sausage making that was going on, uh, and uh, you know the, the various things that uh, that she wanted in um, and, she, and thought were, were were relevant for the public to know, uh, and the things that both Fallon and this guy Bauer cut out. You know, just uh, yeah, continuing the whitewash. I, th I think she wanted stuff in there. She was she was concerned uh, about violence against women, which is why she wanted that stuff in there. She was appalled that uh, Alan's legacy of uh, crime got to continue for ten years. She felt that was an important thing to uh, you know to, to to bring out in the in the report, and and she she probably does have some mindset of uh, you know this is. There's, there's politics going on here that 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 is politics that is um i don't want to say it sells well but it's uh it's a it's an appropriate stance to take that you give a crap about how women are treated in society um so yeah i i don't necessarily think that uh um she was a very good witness for the for the state um and i think for, for the sausage making she was a decent witness for the uh you know for the uh um prosecutor or i should say the uh, the, uh, the perceived <laughs> let's just put it that way um so yeah I'm, I'm not sure what of her story would have sort of made it into the final lawsuit but it was certainly very telling yeah after, yep. after listening to this one i have a question about um do you think that it was possible that had the depositions gone on and they did Vogel, they did Kasorik, none of this whole box stuff happened for Stephen and it just continued, that they would have eventually called Peg Lautenschlauter either to a deposition or if gone to trial, that she would have been called as a witness in, at, at trial for this? You think that that was on the line in the future, possibly? That's a damn good question. <laughs> Maybe. I mean, uh, inevitably, it's her report, right? Well, right, and it's her, name her, is it's her office that is making all these edits and changes to this document that she put together, right? So, like, that all has to be at the behest of her, right? I mean, she's the head of the office. She's she's the the face of the office. And the authority. Right. So... Do you think she knew about these edits that were happening? Do you think she was, see did they say she was seeing these edits or this was being edited before it was going to peg or I, I kind of am a little wait, yeah. confused on that. Uh, ele elected officials want plausible denial. That's what elected officials want. <laughs> and that's kind you know, of what she, she, she has, her it, right? She, she has her other lawyers doing yeah, the editing yeah. so that she doesn't have to, so she has that plausible di deniability. Now, um, Behind the magic asks, because we were talking about this in the chat, had Peg found wrongdoing, would that been criminal against the LE? Would they have pressed charges against the LE? Was that what would have happened had they found the wrongdoing? And it never went, you know, like back in 2003 instead of going to I, 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 th I think they... I think they could have gone down that road. I, 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 there was obviously a lot of corruption going on in, in Manitowoc County. Um, you know, I, I think that was the the big risk that Kasurik faced being, being sheriff for, for 20 years. He obviously established the power of infrastructure. Who, you know, who, who knows what they would have found if they had dug further. I mean, my, my inclination is to think that they probably would have found more than just this. Uh, and I think there would have been, you know, more than enough reason to co completely and totally ex ex expose, expose him. I think that if the, eventually if, the, if this matter had gone to trial, it would would have been every bit the spectacle that the that the Avery trial itself was, right. and it would have been sort of nightly, um, you know, yeah, debriefs from from the lawyers and things coming up. Uh, it would have been a horror show, and uh, you know, that spectacle they desperately needed to avoid because that kind of spectacle spectacle prompts these investigative reporters to start looking into other stuff to see what they can find, and I bet there was a lot of stuff to find. Well, wait, you called so, them yeah, investigator reporters? Wait, wait, what? Because if that was true, why didn't they look at any of this shit with Avery when the whole box thing happened? I don't see them. They just are, are mouthpieces for the for the DA, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, but well, you're getting up to a higher level. I'm sorry, Big Jeff. 
I'm sorry, Big Ted. You're getting up to a higher level, so that it might have piqued your interest, right? Maybe? I don't know. Maybe that's what they need to actually do some investigating <laughs> journalism. <laughs> I don't know. And, well, and, it, and it, gets, it gets political, too, right? That, uh, you know, certain journalists uh, like to um, investigate one side of the aisle and other journalists like to investigate the other side of the aisle. But that's right. The so Avery like, case um, was getting... The Avery case was getting attacked by both like, sides of the so aisle, right? The, the, the Avery, the <laughs> yeah, the the but the but the Avery bill was passing with with a great deal of bipartisan support, right? So you, you yeah. in, in a very um, atypical situation, you had both sides of the aisle converging to say there was a large wrongdoing here, uh, and that's that's a recipe for you know a disaster for Boss Hog. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Boss Hog Tom Kasurik. <laughs> So um, I, that, that's I agree with the 100 percent with the assertions that were that were being made in your uh, you know uh, your discussion in the chat. But it, would, it would have been a disaster for the for the uh, for, particularly for for Manitowoc, and that's what really needed to be avoided at all costs. So yeah. in in a way, that's kind of like with the appeals process now. They really can't let him out because if he gets exonerated again. The disaster. How are they going to claim it as uh, no wrongdoing? And they're going to have to, you know, people's lives are going to be on the line because, you know, like, uh, you know, Colburn was worried about, was he going to go to prison? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, because that can still that happen reason. in this case with 05 case, right? Like, because if that comes out that they are, you know, corrupted. Yeah, there's another aspect. There's another they, aspect. They can find evidence. There's another aspect you brought up, Big Jeff, about you know just reading Jennifer's deposition. It sounded like she wanted to do the right thing, and then she has this thought: Well, the defense lawyers knew about Alan. Why didn't they pursue him? What? And for for her that, I mean, it's one thing to have the thought, you know, hey, these guys kind of knew, but it sounds to me like there was more of a discussion about it with her and. You know, possibly Fallon, uh, but the Mike Bauer, and, and possibly others. It's like, hey, you know, these guys that knew about it. That set up for 05, too, right? Because they didn't actually investigate anybody else other than Avery. So there is no evidence that the, the, the defense could put in on any other suspect because they don't have the right to go out there and actually make people no, talk the way they that can't do the shit. DA does. And and the cops should have done all of that investigation, if not to rule them in, to rule them out. <laughs> yeah, they don't have subpoena power. They can't say, "Well, if you don't well, look, talk, I'm going to throw success. your ass." Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, look how much uh, success Stephen had in naming a Denny suspect in 2005. <laughs> and now she's going on, going on about, oh, they should have named other people, right? We know what happens when you try and name Denny, sus Denny suspects in Wisconsin, Jennifer. Sorry. That's the point. And now she, you, you, you put that she's a judge now, right? She's a judge in Wisconsin. Just Jennifer yeah, Nash. Was that you? Who put, put that, that in, in the that chat Oh, yes, I can. Absolutely. Just so this but woman who doesn't realize that the defense has no power in investigating anyone. I mean, they can send out their private eyes and ask questions, but they don't really have the power to subpoena records. So like uh, people's phone records and shit like that, that's got to all be done through the courts and the DA. Right. So if they refuse to do that, what what options do they have? And now this woman is a sitting judge. In the Court of Appeals. <laughs> in the Court of Appeals. In, in, in which Court of Appeals? Is she is she Wisconsin? Oh, which one? Though? Like she's not she's not on no. every case in the appeals court. She's not in that district, is she? She's just, she just been in since 2019. So, oh, OK, so she's kind of new to it. But I wonder what you, which district she works for. Like Guntram uh, had to recuse himself from the Court of Appeals decision yeah. on Avery's stuff because he is part of this case. So if she's sitting as an appeals court for Avery's stuff, she's going to have to recuse herself too. <laughs> yeah, I remember seeing. I don't see her name associated with it, but yeah, you okay. you can look at you can look it up. I'm sure it'll tell which yeah. district she's in. I guess I could just do that really quick right now. But yeah, I, I, I still I mean, I, I had, uh, you know, for somebody that was at the DOJ and all these characters that we've read through, I kind of had a lot of respect for her until that moment. It's like, so you're going to blame the defense attorneys and they can't do jack shit about anyone. 
District Four. Where's District Four? Uh, you'd have to look at the map. You have to look at the map. yeah the <laughs> districts. Anyway, so uh, a very I, I did look. There is no other deposition for her, so it ends right there with basically some questions left on the table. These edits, section eight, boom, gone, just gone, cut. <laughs> <laughs> okay, she's down there in like Dane County by Madison and stuff, so I don't think she's in this district. Uh, Stevens in District 3. Stevens yeah. in District 3. And yeah. District four. Well, that's good to know. So, what I think is that, um, that the, th the thing to pay attention to here is was Vogel, was Vogel going to flip, right? Uh, because remember, Vogel had Vogel had got out of politics. You know, he, he probably you know he'd been out of politics since 1986. He was probably very nervous. He knew he knew exactly what he did. There's no question about it. Um, ca calling up Greasebach and saying, yeah, "Was that was that file in there?" Greasebach says he 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 knew he convicted the wrong, uh, wrongfully convicted a person. Greasebach says, of all people. Um, so as we go through these depositions and ask ourselves, was Vogel about to flip? Uh, you, you 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 know you wonder was there a pipeline to Vogel about all the things that were getting cut out of this report, right? I mean, oh no, we can't we can't let that through, right? Uh, our our friend Dennis is uh, you know he's 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 got a he's getting a little nervous about about the types of things. Well, he's in the house. He's in the house seat. Yeah, yeah, and if and if he's gonna flips, if anybody flips, it's over, right? And so, but I and mean, what's the Vogel's gonna get deposed? He's he's scheduled to be deposed on uh, you know like a week after Kasarik. What's he gonna say when they start asking them the questions? Uh, you know, when 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 Kisarik said, "Don't fuck this up." What did that mean to you? Yeah. <laughs> you know, hey, uh, so, uh, Sh he's Cherie, gonna have to sit and answer some very uncomfortable questions. Cherie, who is this uh, that you put in the Discord chat? Who is that? Cherie here. I thought what it was just, maybe not. Uh, maybe it's a newer photo than the one that Big Jeff. Yeah, she does look different if it's her. She sure does. Well, anyway, so, you know, here we are at the end of this one. This is May 13th, and I'm just going to throw this out there to everyone. You know, we've already done uh, Tom Fallon's deposition. It was months ago. Now, I'm willing to take a step back before we move forward to July to William Beck. He's actually the next one in the sequence of depositions. But with everything that we've already discussed more in depth, I'm okay if you guys want to go back and revisit files and go through it, pick it apart. It's entirely up to the group. That one that, one that I don't recall is Jennifer Nashold. And the one that... Uh that Jeff put up looks like it's Deputy Chief Lisa Stark. So I think he's got the wrong, they, they put the wrong picture in and wiki where you got that from Jeff. Hmm. But the one that don't, I don't recall, I, I believe Thank that's you. the one on the court, on the actual Court of Appeals uh, site, that's that's her. Got it, it's, it's on the screen now. Boom. Yeah, there's no photo she included. She's so young. Yeah, she, she does. She's done so much in her career. There's no photo in her deposition um, PDF, so. Maybe she was rewarded for her editorial uh, emissions. Maybe. <laughs> well, you have to wonder what they're they're getting out of this. It's like, right they, like, they might join the system thinking, you know, their career is going to be booming. They're going to do the right thing. And then when they get there, there's all this stuff that they didn't expect, like like having other ADAs edit your report because they don't want you to say this or you don't want to say that. And in order to keep that job, they kind of just fall in line. That's, you know, this is just the way it, like, that show we watched, it's just the way it's done there. It's just the way it's done there. Like, and all the people are, uh, are aware that it's 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 just the way it's done here. You know, it's like... It's, it's, it's a culture. You can see it from the 85 case and all the way up. And if she's writing things that she thinks are concerning against women, they're whitewashing it. There is a big slap on the face of, we don't care. 
So you just keep your head down and play on with your career because it's a culture, you know, That's... and you might not stand alone against it. I That's kind right. of think that is also the mentality that Peg Lautenschlauter had, yep. being, being the first woman AG of Wisconsin. That's big, right? She's the first woman. Wise as well. for, and then she for, got a DUI, which didn't fucking help her career. And now this case, where she kind of just has to, you know, keep falling in line to keep her career. <laughs> After the way they treated Jody, I put nothing past him because that was another one. Of course, it's a different situation still. It was these guys, even even Wendy Baldwin was in, in a few of those. The way they treated her was horrible. And then you think about Wendy Baldwin. Think about what happened with her just years later after the Avery case. Well, she and a friend of hers who also was an officer of the law at Calumet County put on Facebook an effigy that they have, meaning a big bonfire in which they burned a dummy with an officer's uniform that said Pagel and other officers on there. That's telling too. Like, why did they feel? And then they're like, oh, it was just stress. Well, what about these people at their jobs are causing them this stress that they felt the need to take it out in an effigy? <laughs> yeah, that's pretty significant. All right. Well, so, you know, before we get out of here, let's, let's kind of take a consensus. What do you think, Big Jeff? I put, um, a chat, I put in the, the chat uh, asking if they would like us to go over Fallon's deposition again, and a few is saying yes. I see a bunch of ones here. I'm guessing one is Fallon. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think, Big Jeff? Well, what's your I, What's your What's your feeling? Well, I think we got to give the I think we got to give the people. Give the people what they want. I, I say, uh, let's keep them. Let's keep in mind the order. Well, what, what is the order, by the way? After uh, after Jennifer, is it is it uh, yes. and then Fallon, or is Fallon sort of getting near the end? Uh, you uh, Fallon's deposition. Yeah, what's the order of the depositions after after uh, Jennifer? Well, the next one up is in July, which I've got on the screen right now. It's William Beck. There's two on that day. There's William Beck. His was that morning. And then this uh, Lynn Zygmunt, hers was right after his in the afternoon. Now, I don't know who William Beck is, but Lynn Zygmunt is. He's an elf. Like, okay, she was the one who was, uh, what do they call that? The, the clerk of the court. Yeah, she she's clerk. She's clerk. clerk yeah, she's a, she's a court clerk. That's right. Uh, Fallon's uh, deposition was actually, let me go over here and give you the right day here. That one, uh, I thought it was right there. Tom Fallon's was May the 12th. But it was the day before part two of Debs. Like I said, we'll be taking a step. We'll be taking a step back. But again, you know, to be in the. So the, so the, the order. The order was um, Tinker was first, right? And then Amy, then Fallon, and then Deb. Uh, let me see here. I didn't realize Fallon was up there so high. It's going to be on the screen here just in a second. His was the afternoon of May 12th. So it had been after um, Amy and Deb earlier that day. This was later that afternoon. So, I mean, I think we should, like, proceed in order. And if uh, Fallon's kind of stepped backwards, that means we kind of missed him in the order that we went through him. Yeah, I'm off. I'm off with him. Well, no, we didn't really miss it. I had already done it. That's what I'm saying. Uh, oh, we had, okay. That's why, because he's been mentioned a lot. Can you say the word? He's been mentioned. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, thank you, uh, multiple times. Uh, not only today, but uh, when we covered the other two parts of Deb Strauss. If there was an interest in going back and dissecting his, we didn't. Di we we did dissect it to some degree in the 
original one that uh, we did on this. But again, that's why I said it. We don't have to. I'm fine with moving forward with him, William Beck. Did you do Monica already? Um, uh, for uh, He's on the 13th. You know what? She might be next, actually. Let me see here. Did I miss one? May 13th. I'm not showing Monica on the 13th. Am I missing hers? Hers is on the 12th. And we've already done her. her hers must have been pretty short, right? Because Jennifer National said she didn't have anything to do, with, hardly anything to do with writing the report. There's Monica Burkhart Britt. It says to tinker up there, but it's actually Monica. Hers was uh, 37 pages total, so no, it wasn't very long. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm totally up for doing Fallon again. Um, I, I think the, the it'll probably take, looking at the length of it and knowing who Fallon is, it'll probably take three two-hour videos to get through it the way, at the rate we're dissecting it. I think that's the way it should be dissected. Yes. I think it would have a lot of context to what we've just had as well. Works for me. All right. Uh, yeah, his is right at 100 pages. So, yeah, it probably would, would take two or three parts to dissect as, uh, as we've been doing so far. So, okay, that's what we'll do then. Uh, the, the word has been given. So, oh, that, that's what I, like I think uh, they are. Me, sorry, Jack. Just me has joined us in chat, and they say they said that is William Beck, is Andrew Beck's father. Andrew Beck is Drug Metro. Okay. Yeah, I see that now. Yeah. Yeah. So okay, well, I, I guess the plan is now we'll we'll start um, probably. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna say next Sunday we'll we'll start on Fastbender, and uh, hopefully we can get through it in two two different parts. It may take three because I think there's gonna be a lot uh, to talk about with him, especially in connection with what we've just covered here the last couple of weeks with uh, Deb Strauss and Amy Lehman. So let's plan to do it that way. You With mean that, Fallon, not Fassbender. I'm sorry. Yeah, Fallon. Okay. Yeah. So that's the way we'll plan it for now. In the interim, I mean, we've been here for a while now, so let's let's get this wrapped up. Um, coming up tomorrow, I don't know how many, uh, how often I can, how much we can do this coming week, but uh, probably try to get at least two more open mics in to uh, finish up the Coburn v. Netflix documents. I think we can do it in two. I don't think it'll take three because uh, we're probably not going to read every single bit of uh, everything that's left. I think some of it's repeat stuff, but we'll cover the stuff that is new so we can uh, get it on the record, talk about it, whatever. Balance going to lose. So is Colburn. <laughs> him too okay um, just quickly moving down the list final comments Alice just thank you to everyone who's joined us in chat and stuck with us um, and thanks to the panel um, I think we do a great job on dissecting things um, and looking into it bit by bit uh, and coming up with the things that we do. So it's very much appreciated, one and all. Thank you. Excellent. Big Jeff. I'd like to thank everybody who stuck it out through uh, through this long one. As we go through these, you can you can really kind of see, you know, the the, 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 the snake sort of circling around the, the state and beginning to, to squeeze them tight. Uh, and it all leads to the culmination that they needed a whopper. This needed to stop, and they needed a whopper. 
uh, and uh, we, we, we know what happened. So it's, I think this is why we need to go through this. Excellent. Let's go. Um, yeah, look, uh, great to be a part of it, the panel. Such great researchers, and just the more we talk about it, timeline seems to go in and flesh out. Took a long time to go over, but I think we're kind of, with everybody looking at it with their opinions and gathering together, and like Jeff and yourself, you sort of like make sense of such a confusing case. And as I said, uh, and the filmmaker says, it's all about the 1985 case. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Disco. I think that's spot on. Cherie, Cherie from Our Legal Mind. Well, I, thank you for doing these, and I'm really giving, it's really giving me a lot to think about, and I'm learning a lot, too, so thank you. Absolutely. It's definitely interesting. And Sugar. Susan. Yes, I enjoyed that very much. It's It's so interesting to go through this and it's it's just um frustrating that these what these people got away with but you know makes me kind of sick to my stomach actually but yeah. thanks everybody for being here we had a good uh chat tonight and and uh a lot of people watching so we appreciate your support absolutely thank you susan jinxie final thoughts I just want to thank you for allowing me to join you guys and talk about stuff and remind anybody can come up and join you. If you just take that Discord link and join us on here on Voice, too, if you have anything you want to say. So thanks for giving me that opportunity, and thanks for joining us. Thank you, Jinxie, and, and for the, 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 the good combo, good, good, good stuff. And Dr. Silkman, final words. Uh, I just want to thank uh, Big Jeff and also Alice for the excellent reading. Uh, it's fantastic that uh, we have an opportunity to go through these depositions. Um, I've certainly learned a lot and uh, we all continue to learn a lot. And um, it's fantastic that we can do these. It is very, very frustrating um, hearing the depositions and hearing all the double speak and all the bullshit and all the obfuscation that takes place, right? These guys were never going to admit that they had done something wrong. They are never, ever going to say sorry to Stephen or Penny. Um, and uh, the way we can see the corruption unfold in real time as we're going through these depositions. And uh, boy, did this, as Big Jeff alluded to, we needed a whopper and we got one. So thank you, guys. And again, thank you for your support. Much appreciated. Thank you. Yeah, isn't it interesting, Doc, uh, you know, as we look at things now, again, I mean, we've read through these documents before, but again, now we're reading with more knowledge of the you know, of the case and so forth, how it uh, ultimately changes uh, and we can put more into it. It, um, it really is, I mean, this whole team, uh, as we're all lucky because there's so many talented researchers here and also people in chat, um, there's a lot of information that comes through uh, and we all have different strengths, et cetera, et cetera, in our research. But what we can do is that we can find parallels where things start to fit together. I'll tell you what, 99% of the population would have no idea what was going on. And now we can see the critical importance of what happened to Stephen in 1985 and sort of like the cover-ups which were involved. And mind you, these are meant to be senior legal people. And just the bullshit and obfuscation that these guys were doing and the double speak and the fact that they were editing the documents, I really think speaks volumes, right? If they were able to do this, right, imagine how many other shenanigans took place in other cases. Uh, it's actually very frightening when you think about it. Yep. Plus the fact that at, at this very moment, senior people in the state of Wisconsin knew what was going on with Gregory Allen and didn't say anything. Correct. They really, they really uh, want Gregory Allen to disappear. They don't oh. want to bring up his name. No. They don't want to dredge that up because I tell you what, 
imagine if some of the victims had actually um, undergone a civil uh, class action civil suit against the MTSO and against Kasarik and Vogel. Now, wouldn't that have been interesting? I and wonder it, how they would have handled that. And it very well could have happened if that information had came out in a timely manner. Of course. Uh, no, no doubt. And if that information had come out during Stephen Avery's trial, you know, you could imagine uh, the effect that it would have had, especially if it was in the media. So they had to keep it quiet, right? Don't bring it up. And you think to yourself, why on earth would legal people want to protect uh, a crazy sex addict like uh, Gregory Allen? And that's what it looks like. They're protecting him. And yet, at the same token, guys, anything that Stephen Avery did, they amplified it and made sure that no one forgot it. <laughs> but the same isn't true with Gregory Allen. I don't know. I have no answers to it. Thank you very much, Doc. Thank you. Uh, so with that said, uh, I think we've had an excellent discussion with uh, well, health, so many. And, you know, we do thank everyone. It's a, it's a lot of extra, um, but I, I think it's worth it to, and it is, re, we, we are restating some, a lot of the stuff that we knew, but I think we're restating it in a much better and more informed fashion. Uh, I think it's really good to continue to go through it. Uh, we're in the, again, hopefully we're going to get a response here in the next short while from the state current stuff. And I'm sure we'll be uh, dissecting that as well. It'll be interesting to what they say. They have until December 1st, so tick-tock, tick-tock, right? That time's coming quickly. I'd certainly like to thank everyone in the live chat for, you know, hanging around the good conversation. I know that the conversation went off into some different areas, and, and I, you know, that's fine. Um, and certainly the conversation here about these depositions. So, like I said, if we'll be back on tomorrow... We're changing gears. We're going back to Cobra and be Netflix. We'll get through that. And um, that's, yep. Yeah. And then next Sunday, we'll plan on diving into Mr. Balance. So, with that said, if you like what we're doing, give us a like and subscribe. Share the, share the video, share the information. So, the more talking about it, the better. The more eyes, the better. And all that. So, with that said, it's been a Five Play production.